In 1846, near a border traced by a river, two neighbors went to war. The fighting between the United States and Mexico began near the Rio Grande, then raged deep into the heart of the Mexican nation. From the shores of the Pacific to the Gulf Coast of Veracruz, to a final assault on the halls of Matazuma, Mexico City itself. In the end, Mexico was stripped of nearly half its territory. California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Land that transformed the United States into a continental power reaching from sea to sea. This is the story of a war that reshaped the continent and forged a new identity for its peoples. A war that caused wounds that have yet to heal. The war between the United States and Mexico. The soldiers came from every region of their country, from Missouri, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Maine, from Chihuahua, Oaxaca, Guanajuato, and Veracruz. They met at Palo Alto, Cerro Gordo, Buena Vista, and on other faraway battlefields, where men with names like Holloway and Smith and Page, Flores, Cano, Rivera, fought each other and died. There were others who were not soldiers, ordinary people called upon to sacrifice everything to war. For Mexican and Indian families in the territory surrendered to the United States, there was a bitter consequence, even to peace. Many would be made to feel like foreigners in their native land. In the late summer of 1848, a group of 15 Mexican writers, intellectuals, soldiers, and politicians gathered near the fallen capital to write an account of the recent conquest of their country. One of the writers was a young journalist named Guillermo Prieto, destined to become one of his nation's most beloved poets. Prieto and the others called their work Apuntes, notes for the history of the war between Mexico and the United States. For the first time, they came to measure their strength and to sustain the rights of the respective nations. These sons of two distinct races now meeting to appear before a supreme being, destroying each other in the new continent as they had in the old. They are a group of Mexicans who recognize that they have not done things well, but that the military defeat was not a moral defeat, that out of that experience would come lessons that would save the country, consolidate the country. In the United States, soldiers, journalists, artists, and historians published their own accounts of the war with Mexico. Some saw the victory as proof that theirs was a model republic favored by God. Yet others wondered if the conquered territory had come at the price of the nation's ideals. Thousands of returning soldiers, men like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Ulysses S. Grant brought back experience that would serve them well against each other in the Civil War to come. But for now, it seemed that the war had forged a national identity, had revealed what one writer called the native germ of the American character. America is the country of the future. It is a country of beginnings, of projects of vast designs and expectations. The bountiful continent is ours, state on state and territory on territory, to the waves of the Pacific Sea. 
one thing is plain. Here in America is the home of man. Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was the beginning of a new era. The United States and Mexico would share a new border, would have to learn to live together as neighbors. Mexican War was a clash between neighbors who were strangers, two republics born into separate worlds. One was a brash, rapidly expanding nation of 20 million, driven by democratic principles and transformed by new technologies. The United States was oftentimes referred to as a go-ahead nation, in quotation marks, a go-ahead people, uh, with the locomotive almost as a symbol. This is all part of this boundlessness, all part of this idea of no limits uh, on what people can achieve. Meanwhile, Mexico's seven and a half million people were living a very different experience, rooted in Spanish and native traditions handed down for centuries. Mexico City, capital of New Spain for 300 years and of the Aztec Empire before that, had always been the cultural and political heart of the nation. Here, a university, printing houses, hospitals, and theaters had flourished before the pilgrims landed on the shores of Massachusetts Bay. The United States was born modern. They are already under the influence of the Industrial Revolution, of a capitalist system. When Mexico takes shape after the Spanish conquest and the blending with indigenous peoples, it inherits medieval European institutions, or almost medieval, and a deep history of native traditions. For the United States, to be modern is an act of natural evolution. For Mexico, to become modern means tearing down its institutions, destroying its social system, and changing its way of thinking. From 1810 to 1821, Mexico fought a successful but devastating war for independence from Spain. Some hoped to establish a political system inspired by the U.S. model. But the early years of the new republic were chaotic. The government was constantly undermined by generals fighting for power. In the 27 years between the revolution and the end of the war with the United States, Mexico would undergo 22 changes of administration. At its core, the country was experiencing a terrible crisis because it had lost its sense of leadership and political control, and this made Mexico ex. One of Mexico's greatest resources was land, almost one and a half million square miles. But the ten-year struggle for independence had devastated the nation's economy and decimated its population. Mexico was left unable to colonize its distant northern provinces. And the borderlands lay directly in the path of a growing United States. The United States had grown by purchasing land from other nations. But when the U.S. tried to buy Mexican territory, Mexico would not sell. For them, it was a matter of national honor, not just pride, to maintain the integrity of all of the territory they had inherited from Spain. Now Mexico worried that what the United States couldn't buy, it would take. The haughtiness of these Republicans does not permit them to look on us as equals, but as inferiors. In my opinion, their conceit extends itself so far as to believe that their capital will be the capital of all the Americas. Jose Manuel Sosaya, first Mexican minister to the United States. Two republics, bound by geography, 
yet separated by different histories and cultures. Few doubted that a showdown was approaching. In 1836, Mexico suffered a wound that it would blame on the United States. The blow was struck here, in Mexico's northern province of Tejas. In the Texas of 1821, only 2,500 Mexicans lived near a scattering of isolated missions and in a few small settlements. Tejanos lived deep in Indian territory, far from the protection of Mexico City. More colonists were needed. In 1823, the Mexican government made a fateful decision. It opened Texas to foreign settlers. The offer was cheap land and deferred taxes. Immigrants would become Mexican citizens. The plan worked only too well. North Americans flooded across the border bringing with them their own language and culture. When Mexico tried to close the border, the immigrants came anyway, illegally. Mexican residents in Texas soon found themselves outnumbered 10 to 1. Y como no teníamos un and since we did not have an army to guard the border, we know how difficult it is today to protect it, right? Even if you set up roadblocks or whatever, people can get through. Well, in those days, it was very easy. For years, the colonists managed their own affairs. But in 1835, the Mexican Congress abolished most of the state's rights and centralized power in Mexico City. The move triggered a series of revolts in states across the country, Zacatecas, California, Yucatan, and Texas. On December 12, 1835, Sam Houston, commander-in-chief of the rebel Texas Army, issued a proclamation. Citizens of Texas, you have realized the horrors of anarchy and the dictation of military rule. Your rights must be defended. The oppressors must be driven from our soil. The rebellion in Texas infuriated Mexico's president, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. The foreigners who wage war against the Mexican nation have violated all laws and do not deserve any consideration. And for that reason, no quarter will be given them. In their audacity, they have declared a war of extermination against the Mexicans, and we should treat them in the same manner. 41 years old, General Santa Ana was a career military officer who had risen to the presidency through a shrewd combination of ambition, charisma, and guile. The general was fond of the dramatic gesture. He would take care of the rebellion in Texas himself. Viva! Viva Santa Ana! In February of 1836, Viva! Santa Ana and his army arrived in Texas. The first major battle was fought near San Antonio at an abandoned mission known as the Alamo. Against the advice of his own officers, Santa Ana ordered his troops to storm the compound. All of the defenders inside were killed. But the Mexicans suffered far too many casualties for a victory Santa Ana later said was but a small affair. Two weeks later at Goliad, Mexican officers acting on Santa Ana's orders executed 340 Texas prisoners. The brutality of the campaign was meant to force the Texans into submission. Instead, Remember the Alamo and Goliad became battle cries of revenge. At San Jacinto, not far from the Texas coast, the afternoon of April 21st was warm and drowsy. Santa Ana was confident of victory. His troops were resting. 
Suddenly, Sam Houston's Texans charged the Mexican camp. The battle was over in 20 minutes, but the killing continued until the Texans had satisfied their vengeance. More than 600 Mexicans were killed. 700 were taken prisoner. Santa Ana tried to escape, but was captured and brought before Houston. He was dressed in the pants of a private, still wearing his silk shirt. It was a moment those who were there would never forget, the birth of the independent Republic of Texas. In Mexico, the loss unleashed a wave of anger against the United States. We made a present of Texas to the Americans of the North, wrote a general named Jose Maria Tornelli Mendeville. After we took them to our bosom, they destroyed us. The loss of Texas would inevitably result in the loss of New Mexico and the Californias. Little by little, our territory will be absorbed until only an insignificant part is left to us. Our national existence, acquired at the cost of so much blood, would end like those weak meteors which, from time to time, shine fitfully in the firmament and disappear. For Santa Ana, the loss of Texas would forever be a mark of humiliation and defeat. Since I was not a tragic hero in my misfortune, I am branded a traitor. The distance between one and the other is immense. Disgraced, Santa Ana returned to his estate in Mexico. Two years later, he suffered another loss, a battle wound that led to the amputation of his left leg below the knee. The surgeon did a poor job, and Santa Ana would live the rest of his life in pain. But he used the incident to win back the hearts of his country's people. Once again, he became president of Mexico, only to be once again forced from office. As he sailed for exile in Havana that spring of 1845, even Santa Ana could not have predicted that he would return the following year to lead his country against the armed forces of the United States. On a rainy day in March, 1845, United States President James Knox Polk stood on the steps of the Capitol in Washington. There, he delivered an inaugural address intended to be heard not only in his own country, but in the capitals of Mexico and Great Britain. Since the Union was formed, the number of states has increased from 13 to 28. Foreign powers do not seem to appreciate the true character of our government. To enlarge its limits is to extend the dominions of peace over additional territories and increasing millions. James K. Polk had entered the presidency with a solid reputation as a congressman and speaker of the House. His wife Sarah had managed his early political campaigns and was well known in Washington circles for her intelligence and charm. By comparison, Polk was considered humorless and rigid, even by those who admired the discipline he brought to his job. He had a very strong sense of duty and professional obligation, and a very, very strong work ethic. As he was fond of saying, uh, I am the hardest working man in the United States, and few could really argue with him. Each evening, Polk would meticulously chronicle the day's accomplishments in his diary. Here he complained that his days were filled with office seekers, visiting groups of school children, tourists staring at him as he ate. Only at night could he reflect on what he had come to the White House to achieve. Polk's goals were influenced by his mentor, Andrew Jackson, whose philosophy of westward expansion had inspired a new generation. They believe that the government should open up these regions so that, they, so that the resources there can be exploited. And anything that gets in the way of that exploitation should obviously be removed. 
the expansionist vision would be condensed into one of the most powerful phrases in American history, manifest destiny. It was a conviction that God had intended North America to be under the control of the Americans. It's a kind of early projection of Anglo-Saxon supremacy. And there is a racist element in it, but there is also an idealistic element. To extend the boundaries of the United States was to extend the area of freedom. This was, this was a, common, a common feeling. Uh, the model republic had certain uh, obligations. During his campaign, Polk had called for the annexation of Texas and the occupation of Oregon Territory. But on both issues, he faced the risk of war. Mexico had never recognized the independence of Texas. Great Britain claimed Oregon. But the first diplomatic crisis of the Polk administration would involve Mexico. In February of 1845, the U.S. Congress voted to annex Texas. For years, Mexico had warned the United States that to do so would be the equivalent of war. Mexican Ambassador Juan Almonte wrote to the U.S. Secretary of State calling the annexation of Texas an act of aggression. Nowhere in the annals of modern history can one find a more unjust act to rob a friendly nation like Mexico of so large a portion of her territory. Almonte then demanded his passport, breaking diplomatic relations. The United States and Mexico we're now one step closer to war. In July of 1845, President Polk ordered U.S. troops to the Texas coast. Their mission was to defend the border with Mexico. Texas had accepted the United States offer of annexation and Mexican troops were on the march north under orders to secure the border with the United States. In Mexico City, powerful voices were calling for war. Even so, the government of President General Jose Joaquin de Herrera hoped for a peaceful solution. Herrera had inherited a country left in shambles by Santa Ana and the president was convinced that Mexico could not win a war with the United States. But with the nation in the grip of war fever, Herrera knew that his desire for peace could lead to his downfall. A scholar and politician, Jose Fernando Ramirez, saw the dilemma clearly. The struggle will be lost by the first one to speak about peace. And for that reason, no one wants to express the terrible word. Quietly, Herrera looked for a way to preserve national honor without going to war. He let it be known that he would accept an envoy from the United States to discuss the Texas question. Polk responded quickly. His choice for the mission was John Slidell, a congressman from Louisiana who was fluent in Spanish. But now the president's objective extended beyond Texas to the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. There were rumors that Britain also had its eye on California. Polk instructed Slidell to try and buy it first. Slidell was told to remind Mexico that it owed the United States more than two million dollars. The claims would be forgiven if Mexico would sell its northern territories to the United States. Mientras el gobierno mexicano piensa que el enviado while the Mexican government thinks the representative, the special North American representative, is coming to renew relations and surely to pay or arrange for indemnification for the loss of Texas. For the North Americans, Texas is already a thing of the past. And the only thing that interests them is to buy territory. The one way to provoke the Mexicans into resistance was the way that Polk had chosen, that is to uh, present a, a strong front and bluff the Mexicans into resisting or into uh, yielding. 
In other words, negotiating with them at cannon's point. Polk's instructions were leaked to the press, and Slidell arrived in Veracruz amid reports that Herrera was about to sell off the northern territories. The Mexican president was caught completely off guard. He tried to put off the meeting with Slidell, but it was too late. He and his cabinet were accused of treason. Desperately, Herrera tried to save his government and convince his country that there was no honor in fighting a war the nation could not sustain. War with the United States over Texas is a bottomless abyss into which the Republic will sink along with all her hopes for the future. By now, few were listening. In San Luis Potosí, north of Mexico City, an ambitious general named Mariano Paredes watched as Herrera's government crumbled. Paredes was under orders to march north to the defense of the Texas border. Instead, he turned his army around, marched on Mexico City, and forced Herrera to resign. As the new president of Mexico, Mariano Paredes promised to lead his country into what he called a necessary and glorious war. Corpus Christi, September 4th, 1845. Dear Sue, this is the dirtiest place I believe I was ever in. It is almost impossible to keep clean. I have got on a dark woolen purple shirt. It may smell a little after the second week, but the strong breeze carries off the odor. I have just been begging Crittenden to wash himself but he appears, like all the rest, to have no regard for the nasal or optical organs of his fellow wallowers. Napoleon Dana. He had been named for his father's heroes, but Lieutenant Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana arrived in Texas determined to find glory on his own. Dana was one of 4,000 U.S. soldiers camped on the beach at Corpus Christi and along the banks of the Nueces River. The small force represented almost half of the entire Army of the United States. The soldiers were poorly paid. Nearly 50% of the enlisted men were recent immigrants. No, no, that army was... Uh was no powerhouse, it was, it, a juggernaut was not the word for that army at that time. But uh, they had good officers, West Point had began to take hold. West Point was founded 43 years earlier, but it was not appreciated, it was always on the verge of being done away with. Our tradition has been always that fear, always that fear of militarism, and therefore uh, taking every measure possible to prevent the military from beginning to feel too important. The troops were commanded by a 61-year-old general from Kentucky named Zachary Taylor. Raised on the frontier, Taylor was blunt and plain-spoken. The general disdained military pomp and ceremony and disregarded regulations concerning military dress. He favored straw hats, wore ragged pants and dusty coats one man said he looked more like an old farmer going to market with eggs. But Taylor had earned respect for the fearless way he had fought alongside his men five years earlier during the Seminole Indian War in Florida. To his soldiers, who admired both his courage and his homespun ways, he was known as Old Rough and Ready. Throughout the fall and winter of 1845, Taylor organized his army. There was plenty of time for young officers like Napoleon Dana and 23-year-old Ulysses S. Grant, only two years out of West Point, 
to train with the troops under their command. Now you would think that in a country of whom so many of the citizens were frontiersmen, that you would pull them together with their muskets and you'd have an army. But it so happens that the techniques you use for survival on the frontier include running away when the situation calls for it, uh, includes uh, independence and self-reliance. Well, now, those are all fine virtues, but when you come to an army, you want people who do what you say, and also, if you tell them to hold a position at all costs, including their lives, they stay there, and they do. Now, that takes discipline. That takes a lot of work. A West Point graduate named Samuel Ringgold used the time to relentlessly drill his light artillery units, a fast-moving force the soldiers called flying artillery. In battle, Taylor was known to favor his infantry, relying on the brutal efficiency of the bayonet. Major Ringgold was eager for the chance to prove the worth of his men, and Lieutenant Dana was tired of waiting. Dear Sue, if Mexico declares war, I believe General Taylor means to march us right on to Matamoros. If he does, it is to be hoped that we will not get a whipping. What a military show we have here, and how much of the pomp of war and none of the glory. I wish I had all of my glory and was on my way home again. But let us hold on and see what Mr. Polk is going to do. Dear Julia, Everyone rejoices at the idea of leaving Corpus Christi. It is to be hoped that our troops being so close on the borders of Mexico will bring about a speedy settlement of the boundary question. I think the chances of a fight are about equal to the chances for peace. Ulysses Grant. On the 8th of March, 1846, with the Dragoons and Major Ringgold's flying artillery leading the way, the U.S. Army crossed the Nueces River, heading south. With the failure of the Slidell mission, Polk had ordered Taylor to take a position on the Rio Grande, called the Rio Bravo by the Mexicans, opposite the town of Matamoros. The decision was certain to anger Mexico further. Mexico had claimed the Nueces River as its border with Texas, but Polk had adopted Texas' claim that the border was at the Rio Grande. When Taylor crossed the Nueces, he was crossing into disputed territory. He was in territory that Mexico claimed legitimately as part of its own land. And if he went down as far as the Rio Bravo and crossed it, then he would be in territory that wasn't even in dispute. It was Mexican territory. In late March, the first of Zachary Taylor's soldiers reached the north bank of the Rio Grande. Across the river in Matamoros, a crowd of Mexican soldiers and civilians watched as the U.S. troops rigged a flagpole and ran up the Stars and Stripes. The soldiers of the Army of the North were angered by the enemy's insult. For the first time, that flag waved proudly before our forces, as if taking possession of what rightfully belonged to us. Jose Maria Iglesias. The U.S. troops set to work building an earthen and wood fort they called Fort Texas. And for three weeks, tensions mounted as the U.S. and Mexican armies faced each other across the Rio Grande. We are prepared for attack at any moment, often sleep in our clothes. Both sides appear to be always on the alert. We heard the Mexican horns and bugles across the river, blowing all night. Lieutenant Napoleon Dana. As more Mexican troops gathered in Matamoros, some European observers predicted a quick Mexican victory. Mexico's regular army was three times as large as that of the United States. 
but the ranks were filled with inexperienced troops, peasants and Indians pressed into service through what were called cuotas de sangre, quotas of blood. The army did have its elite, among them handsomely uniformed lancers, whose skill on horseback was matched by their courage. But the army lacked a corps of well-trained officers, and Mexican military tactics had not changed since the days of the Spaniards. On April 24th, the stalemate on the Rio Grande was broken when fresh troops led by General Mariano Arista arrived in Matamoros. That same day, Arista sent 1,600 soldiers across the Rio Grande. At Rancho de Caracitos, about 20 miles from Fort Texas, the Mexican soldiers surprised a U.S. scouting party. Fuego! The attack killed 14 U.S. soldiers and wounded seven. The rest were taken prisoner. The skirmish at Rancho de Caracitos was over in minutes. But as far as Zachary Taylor was now concerned, the United States was at war. The general sent a dispatch to Army headquarters in Washington. April 26, 1846. Hostilities may now be considered as commenced, and I have this day deemed it necessary to prosecute the war with energy and carry it, as it should be, into the enemy's country. General Zachary Taylor. Taylor knew he was in a dangerous position. His supplies were on the coast at Point Isabel. The army's survival depended on protecting them. The general set out for Point Isabel with 2,000 soldiers, leaving 500 troops to defend Fort Texas, with orders to fight to the last man. The Mexican artillery in Matamoros rained a continual barrage on Fort Texas. The shelling could be heard all the way to Point Isabel. Lieutenant Ulysses Grant remembered the dreadful sound. As we lay upon the seashore, the artillery at the fort could be distinctly heard. The war had begun. What General Taylor's feelings were, I do not know, but for myself, a young second lieutenant who had never heard a hostile gun before, I felt sorry that I had enlisted. Taylor's men quickly loaded their supplies into 200 wagons and began the march back to Fort Texas. On the afternoon of May 8th, they found General Arista's army waiting for them. A line of nearly 4,000 Mexican soldiers, infantry, cavalry, and artillery stretched a mile across a wide plain of tall, sharp grass and cactus. The Battle of Palo Alto began with the roar of cannon fire and quickly turned into an artillery duel. The soldiers of Major Ringgold's flying artillery used their skills to deadly effect. Advancing their batteries at full gallop, they could unlimber, fire, remount, and whirl off to a new position with astonishing speed. Time after time, Ringgold's units raked the Mexican lines, slashing their ranks with a rain of hot iron. The American artillery ravaged the Mexican ranks horribly. The troops, frustrated by the needless deaths, cried out for permission to attack the enemy at Bayonet's Point and die as brave men should. Jose Maria Iglesias. But Arista's officers ordered the Mexican troops to hold their position. This they did, at the cost of many lives. As Ringgold advanced yet again on the Mexican lines, a cannonball ripped through both his thighs. The wound was horrible, and the Major lingered for three days before he died. When evening fell, 
the Mexican troops withdrew to reorganize, while the U.S. soldiers passed the night on the battlefield. The weary men slept through the groans and screams of the wounded from both sides. The surgeon saw, said one, was going the live long night. During the night, General Arista had ordered his army to fall back to a new position at Resaca de la Palma, an old riverbed cutting across the road to Fort Texas. Arista had chosen well. A natural barrier of thick and thorny underbrush lined the riverbed. But encouraged by the previous day's success, Taylor ordered his men forward. Now, U.S. and Mexican soldiers met each other face to face. To my feelings, I do not think that our war will last much longer. The people of Mexico will not stand it. On Saturday, May 9th, unaware of the fighting in Texas, President Polk and his cabinet discussed what steps to take next with Mexico. All agreed that if the Mexican forces at Matamoros committed any act of hostility on General Taylor's forces, I should immediately send a message to Congress recommending an immediate declaration of war. In fact, Polk had already started to draft a war message. The president was frustrated by the failure of the Slidell mission. He hoped a declaration of war would pressure Mexico into resolving the Texas border issue and selling its northern territories. At six o'clock that very evening, Polk received the news he needed to make his case to Congress. It was Taylor's report describing the Mexican attack on his scouting party at Rancho de Caracitos two weeks earlier. That night and all day Sunday, the president worked on completing his call to arms. After repeated menaces, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States and shed American blood upon the American soil. As war exists, notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it, and exists by act of Mexico herself, we are called upon by every consideration of duty and patriotism to vindicate the honor, the rights, and the interest of our country. Polk's war message was cheered by expansionists in Congress and attacked by a small but vocal opposition. Some charged that Polk had overstepped the authority of his office by starting a war without congressional approval. Others opposed the war because they opposed slavery. They feared that any land taken from Mexico would add more slave territory to the Union. The arguments which Polk's Democrats used were, we must back up the troops. They have been attacked by Mexico, and we must send them supplies, and we must send them reinforcements. And if we do that, we might as well declare war. In the end, Congress authorized $10 million and 50,000 volunteers. It was a small but historic appropriation. For the first time, tens of thousands of American soldiers would be sent to fight on foreign soil. Just as the U.S. Congress issued its call for volunteers, news of Taylor's victories at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma swept the nation. The war was the first in U.S. history to be covered by mass circulation newspapers. The Alamo, Goliad, and other stories from the Texas Revolution 10 years earlier had made a deep impression on people in the United States. Many were eager to join the fight. 
the news was, was hailed with a great deal of excitement. It was just a, a, a wave of, of uh, rejoicing and excitement, the news of these battles. Business was suspended, shops would close, people would be out in the streets celebrating. Uh, and of course, uh, it had a direct impact on the recruiting of the volunteers. And the volunteers now flooded the, the recruiting offices in numbers that, that uh, far exceeded the quotas. In New York, Walt Whitman, poet and editor of the Brooklyn Eagle, fanned the flames of American patriotism with editorials bursting with passion and prejudice. Let our arms now be carried with a spirit which shall teach the world that while we are not forward for a quarrel, America knows how to crush as well as how to expand. What has miserable, inefficient Mexico, with her superstition, her burlesque upon freedom, her actual tyranny of the few over the many, what has she to do with the peopling of the new world, with a noble race? Be it ours to achieve that mission. Dramatic images of the war spread to parlors and drawing rooms through inexpensive prints and sheet music. Pianos were extremely popular during this period of time, and there was a flood of sheet music being issued, published uh, with beautiful, embellished, and, and sometimes fantastic lithographs uh, describing at least the perception of some of the battles. Major Samuel Ringgold, the artillery officer killed at Palo Alto, became the first martyr of the war with Mexico. Oh, heard ye that shout, we have conquered the foe, how it rings and rehearsals are mountain and plain. And music, there was music written for him, the lament for Major Ringgold, and lithographs, a great many, not always agreeing on how he died. There was this thirst for, for heroes and this idea that the Mexican War opened up a new heroic age uh, now that would he help to strengthen and enhance the model republic in the eyes of the world. And, and Ringgold had the, had the good fortune of being killed uh, in the first battle. Young men who had never experienced war imagined themselves carrying on the glorious tradition of the founding fathers of the republic. Some wore uniforms of their own devising. They brought their own horses and elected their own officers. Like many civic-minded men, 45-year-old Jefferson Peake of Warsaw, Kentucky, raised his own company of volunteers. Peake went to war, leaving behind a wife and seven children to tend the family farm. Dear children, you must all try to behave, and you must feed and salt the cow twice a day. And tell Sarah Ann to put out the sun every day her ma's cherries and raspberries and take them in at night. Wallace and Jeff, my dear boys, see how well you can conduct yourselves. I remain your dear father until death. Jefferson Peake. Jefferson Peak joined thousands of other volunteers who packed the riverboats that steamed down the Ohio and Mississippi, heading for Mexico and the halls of Montezuma. In Mexico City, the government reacted with anger and disbelief to President Polk's claim that Mexico had started the war. Los Mexicanos estaban defendiendo su casa. The Los Mexicans were defending their home. En el territorio que the ones coming todos. into the territory who were foreigners eran were the Americans. Mexico nunca declaró Mexico never declared war against the United States. Mexico the Mexican government issued a declaration of the need to defend its national territory. 
ni un solo miembro del ejército mexicano. Not one member of the Mexican army en territorio was ever in North American territory. Ni siquiera Not even in the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca. This was territory in dispute. By the end of May 1846, Zachary Taylor's army had crossed the Rio Grande and occupied the city of Matamoros. There were those in the United States who were certain that the war would be over quickly. Mexico would prove them wrong. As Taylor waited for reinforcements, the Mexican government issued a call to arms. One defeat does not decide the war. Mexico must fight to the end. And as long as there is one man remaining, he must go and fight the unjust invaders. By the spring of 1846, a border dispute between the United States and Mexico had exploded into war. In bloody fighting on the Texas battlefields of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, U.S. troops had pushed Mexican forces south of the Rio Grande. By the end of June, a second U.S. Army was on the march west, and the war would sweep across the continent, into the Mexican borderlands of New Mexico and California, there to be stopped only by the waters of the Pacific Ocean. The war for the borderlands would forever change the lives of its people. Many would be forced to accept a new identity under a foreign flag. Others would choose to fight to the death. Later that year, U.S. troops would attack Mexico's northern provincial capital of Monterrey. For the first time, Mexicans would be forced to defend themselves street by street and house by house. On May 13, 1846, U.S. President James K. Polk signed a congressional declaration of war against Mexico. The president's objective was to secure the Texas border. Then he would try and force Mexico to sell its northern territories of New Mexico and California to the United States. Each was a valuable prize. The Santa Fe Trail through New Mexico was the most important commercial route in the West. And California's deep water harbors would give the United States access to more profitable trade routes across the Pacific. Immediately, Polk acted on a three-part strategy. First, he ordered the Navy to blockade Mexico's coastlines. Zachary Taylor's army, fresh off its victories on the Rio Grande, would push into northeastern Mexico. And a second army would march west to occupy New Mexico and California. If Mexico would not sell its borderlands, Polk would take them by force. At Fort Leavenworth in present-day Kansas, more than 1,600 U.S. soldiers, including a 1,000 volunteers from Missouri, prepared to head west along the Santa Fe Trail. The Army of the West was led by Colonel Stephen W. Kearney, a tough, disciplined career officer with 30 years' experience on the Western Plains. Kearney's orders were to march the 900 miles from Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe and occupy New Mexico. From Santa Fe, he was to continue another 1,000 miles to California. There, he would meet the naval warships sent by Polk and take California too. The assignment was to conquer half a continent, and Kearney was ready to begin. 
In late June of 1846, he ordered his men west. The prairies but the sea of grass o'er which our wagons roll. We'll reach the Arkansas at last and the old Mexico. The soldiers marched across rolling fields of grass that slowly gave way to vast stretches of barren terrain. General Kearney is a rough old man, for this we only know. He's marched us some 800 miles to fight old Mexico. Indians, who had never seen so many white men on a trail, watched in amazement as the seemingly endless columns churned up a cloud of dust that hung suspended for miles across the horizon. The army included a survey party led by Lieutenant William Emery. Emory's mission was to survey possible railroad routes, to lay the groundwork for the expansion of the United States westward. That the United States would expand, he had no doubt. The road presents few obstacles for a railway, and if it continues as good to the Pacific, it will be one of the routes over which the United States will pass immense quantities of merchandise into what may become in time the rich and populous states of Sonora, Durango, and Southern California. For now, California was almost 2,000 miles away. The trail would lead first to New Mexico. New Mexico was one of the most populous provinces on Mexico's northern frontier. Yet outside the safety of a few settlements like Santa Fe, Taos, and Albuquerque, New Mexico was Indian territory. Ever since the Spanish conquest, settlers had lived among Pueblo Indians, Navajos, Apaches, Comanches, and Utes. Relations between them had long been marked by outbreaks of violence and rebellion. On the eve of the war with Mexico, relations with Indians had actually worsened rather than improved. And one sees that in the laments of frontiersmen as they beg the central government for military help. The territory's governor, Manuel Armijo, sought help from Mexico City. But to wait for protection from the central government, wrote one New Mexican, would be to wait in vain. We are surrounded on all sides by many tribes of heartless barbarians, almost perishing, and our brothers instead of helping us, are at each other's throats in their festering civil wars. The people of the capital city of Mexico were very preoccupied with resolving political problems concerned with the formation of the state and of the government. And this caused them to concentrate more on the center of the country. And the frontier was not attended to with the care and the concern that it merited at the time. Forced to rely on themselves, many New Mexicans looked to the Santa Fe Trail and new opportunities for trade with the United States. Mexico put itself in the position of the sheep inviting the lion to come dine. <laughs> And the Lion King. That is to say, uh, the um, mercantile conquest of what would become the southwestern part of the United States uh, really was the real conquest. The trail brought New Mexicans items they could not get as easily from Mexico. Iron and steel tools, medicine, machine-made textiles. The wagon trains also brought North American traders and many came to stay. One of the most successful of these was an entrepreneur named Charles Bent. Based in Taos, Bent was part owner of a trading post on the Santa Fe Trail, north of the U.S.-New Mexico border. The post was called Bent's Fort. It was managed by Charles' brother, William. Both men had married into prominent families. William was married to Owl Woman, the daughter of a Cheyenne holy man. Charles was married to Maria Ignacia Jaramillo, cousin to Governor Armijo. But some New Mexicans saw the growing influence of the Bents and others like them as a threat. As the number of traders increased, Armijo became alarmed. 
Armijo then, early on, warned the Mexican government against people like Bent. Later, when it became clear that there was going to be no help from Mexico to stem the flow of immigrants, then Armijo tended to befriend those very immigrants, go into business with them, and find, as a practical matter, the best way to get along with them was to join them. Armijo was a shrewd businessman. Even now, the governor had wagons of his own coming down the Santa Fe Trail. What he did not know was that this time, the trail would also bring an invading army. On July 29, 1846, Stephen Kearney's Army of the West reached Bent's Fort. 1,600 men and 20,000 animals crowded into the fort's plaza and sprawled across the surrounding plain. From inside an upstairs room, a young woman named Susan McGoffin lay ill on her bed. McGoffin and her husband had been on their way to Chihuahua with a wagon train full of merchandise. The war had overtaken them, and McGoffin marveled at the commotion outside. July 18 and 46. The shoeing of horses, neighing and braying of mules, the crying of children, the scolding and fighting of men are all enough to turn my head. The fort is crowded to overflowing. Colonel Carney has arrived, and it seems as if the world is coming with him. For three days, Carney allowed his troops to rest. The soldiers had marched more than 600 miles through blistering heat and choking dust. Now they could drink juleps made with brown sugar and Taos whiskey. Their stay was short. Kearney was eager to move on. On August 2nd, the Army of the West left Bent's Fort and crossed the Arkansas River into New Mexico. In Santa Fe, Governor Armijo was told that the army was coming, but there was little he could do with the few regular troops at his command. Still, he urged all New Mexicans to resist. Let us be comrades in arms. Rest assured that your governor is willing and ready to sacrifice his life and all his interests in the defense of his country. During the next few days, between three and four thousand poorly armed New Mexicans gathered where the Santa Fe Trail wound through a narrow pass here at Apache Canyon. Told that the New Mexicans were waiting for them, the U.S. troops descended into the narrows sure that the screams of the enemy would soon pierce the air. But at the bottom of the canyon, the U.S. soldiers were met by only eerie silence. Despite protests from his own men, Armijo had ordered the New Mexicans to disband. The governor had fled south to Chihuahua. Why? One of the great mysteries. But certainly, Part of his calculation must have been that his forces were not particularly well armed. Many of the New Mexicans fought against Indians with bows and arrows. Kearney's troops passed through Apache Canyon unopposed. That same afternoon, they entered Santa Fe. Black eyes looked through the latticed windows at our column of cavaliers, some gleaming with pleasure and others filled with tears. Strange, indeed, must have been the feelings of the citizens, all the future of their destiny vague and uncertain. Their new rulers, strangers to their manners, language, and habits. Richard Elliott, St. Louis Reveille. In the plaza, at the heart of the city, U.S. soldiers raised the stars and stripes above the governor's palace, and Kearney read a proclamation he had issued in each town along the way. The acting governor of New Mexico then spoke in response. 
Do not find it strange if there has been no manifestation of joy and enthusiasm in seeing this city occupied by your military forces. To us, the power of the Mexican Republic is dead. No matter what her condition, she was our mother. With the occupation in place, Carney worked to establish a provisional government. One of his first duties was to meet with a delegation of Pueblo Indians. Centuries earlier, the Pueblos had greeted the arrival of the Spanish with curiosity and hospitality. And when the Americans came, I think uh, the whites, uh, as opposed to the, the Spanish-Mexicans, uh, I think that there was a different relationship because the relationship between the Mexican and the native people was already tinged by a lot of uh, atrocities and, and, and wars and, and, and greed, if you may. And by the time that I think the Americans came, uh, there was a lot of mistrust, and rightly so. Lieutenant William Emery knew that the Pueblos had more than once risen in revolt against the Spanish and Mexican authorities. 300 years of oppression and injustice have failed to extinguish in this race the recollection that they were once the peaceable and inoffensive masters of the country. They are our fast friends now and forever. The lieutenant did not know that before long his fellow Americans would be seen as the oppressors and that bloodshed would follow. Near the end of September 1846, Kearney marched for California with a company of dragoons and Lieutenant Emery's survey party. Before leaving, he appointed Charles Bent as the new territorial governor of New Mexico. The decision angered many New Mexicans. Many people who had been there for a long time, whose family was very, very uh, influential, believed that even though they might not have welcomed the Americans with open arms, that they would have a place in the new regime. They do not get that place, and they're very resentful of it. At the same time, there are many people who are, who are proud, who are proud of their Hispanic heritage, and they see Americans as relatively uncultured people who were coming in and who were occupying their land. Resistance to the new government spread. In Taos, on the cold night of January 19, 1847, Charles Bent was at home with his family. Suddenly, New Mexican and Pueblo Indian rebels kicked in the door. Certain that he was loved by the people of his adopted hometown, Bent tried to calm the intruders. His daughter, Teresina, was five years old at the time. Later, she recalled what happened that night. Father told them, What wrong have I done to you? When you come to me for help, I always helped you and your families. Yes, you did, but you have to die now so that no American is going to govern us. Then they commenced to shoot with the arrows and guns. The men threw the mortally wounded Bent to the floor and scalped him alive. The revolt spread quickly throughout the region. Rebels set fire to stores and homes. U.S. citizens and those thought to be sympathizers were tortured and killed. Padre Antonio Jose Martinez a popular priest and educator, opened his home to terrified families seeking refuge from the violence. Martinez called for an end to the bloodshed, but the revolt would claim the lives of many more. On February 3rd, Colonel Sterling Price and his U.S. troops arrived at Taos Pueblo, where 700 rebels and their families had dug themselves in. There may have been a lot of fear at that time, but then there was an also a, the, the feeling that this force could be repelled. The battle began with a blast of U.S. artillery. For hours, the battery pounded at the walls of the Pueblo. Many inside sought the safety of the heavily defended church. But on the second day, U.S. soldiers hacked through the church's wall and fired a cannon into the breach. Dragoons set the roof on fire. The screams of the wounded echoed into the mountains. Some escaped into the open fields where they were ridden down and killed. 
Those who were there said the creek running through the Pueblo turned red with blood. When it was over, Colonel Price reported 150 New Mexicans and Pueblo Indians dead. U.S. casualties were seven dead and 45 wounded. Price wasted little time in bringing the rebel leaders to trial. 15 defendants were sentenced to death, one for high treason. Padre Martinez called the proceedings frightful and pleaded with Colonel Price for justice. The prosecutor and defense attorneys speak only English. Without explaining to them in Castilian the misfortune that they are being notified of condemnation. And finally, I neglected to mention the quality of the sentencing jury, a class of ignorant men tainted with passion. From rooftops, the people of Taos watched as the convicted men were hanged. Louis Girard, a young adventurer from the United States, helped cut down the bodies. With the execution of those for murder, he wrote, no fault should be found. But for a man to rise in defense of his native country and be hanged for treason, that, Girard thought, was an atrocity most damnable. On the curve of the river, Fringed with large cottonwoods, the moon shone brightly, and all was as still as death, except when a flock of geese or sand cranes were disturbed in their repose. Lieutenant William Emery. South by the Rio Grande, then west towards the Gila River, the 110 men under Stephen Kearney's command marched into the wilderness. The tiny band of soldiers was guided by Kit Carson, the already legendary Taos trapper. Carson had warned them all, the journey would be hard. At the end, the men would be starving. Lieutenant Emery wondered if they would survive even as he coolly measured the features of a strange new world. Strolling over the hills alone, I was struck with the fact that not one object in the whole view, animal, vegetable, or mineral, had anything in common with the products of any state in the Union, with the single exception of the cottonwood. Emery marveled at what he called the perfect stillness and quietude of the landscape. For the native peoples he was soon to meet, this was sacred ground. Most Indian people, and particularly some of the Indian people in the Southwest, have a very deep religious connection with their lands. Their gods are in the land themselves. For many Native American people, history, as we understand it, is as much a function of place as it is of time. The soldiers marched over cedar and pine-covered hills, making their way through the land of the Apache Indians. Emery wrote that the Apaches they met saw the U.S. soldiers as allies. For generations, the Apaches and the Spanish had waged war against each other. Now the Mexican government was paying handsomely for Apache scalps. One of the chiefs broke out in a vehement manner. You have taken New Mexico and will soon take California. Go then and take Chihuahua, Durango, and Sonora. We will help you. The Mexicans are rascals. We hate and will kill them all. Native American people have often been able to retain our, our autonomy by holding, by, by balancing one colonial power against another. The problem, of course, with Kearney's occupation of the American Southwest is that the balance now is gone and Indian people then find themselves uh, at the mercy of the Americans which in many instances uh, proved to be disastrous. For the Native Americans of the Southwest, Kearney's passage would signal the beginning of the most bitter and tragic chapter in the history of their people. 
But here, beneath the distant sky, the men of Kearney's command could not have seemed so significant. Beyond the Colorado River, past ancient abandoned cities, past the cultivated fields of the Pima and Maricopa tribes, across the desert lands of the Mojave Indians. With every labored step, the soldiers pushed the U.S. frontier westward to California. California. This Mexican territory lay so far from Mexico City that its people were called those from the other shore. About 7,000 Californios lived here, mostly along the coast. For many, it was a good life. California's harbors had become busy ports of call for trading ships from many nations. Cowhides from the region were so popular they were known as California banknotes. Among the rancheros who profited most from the growing economy was Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. His vast land holdings included some 150,000 acres in the Sonoma Valley, north of San Francisco Bay. Over the years, Vallejo had built his reputation and his estate by faithfully serving Mexico as an officer in the army. But like other Californios, Vallejo had come to resent Mexico's neglect of the region. The Mexican government did not have on the frontier a single horse, rifle, cannon, or soldier. For a long time, there was not a soldier in the garrison who did not receive his food and clothing, but out of what I gave him, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. In the 1830s, the isolated Californios began to welcome settlers from other countries. About 60 miles from Vallejo's home, a trading post on the Sacramento River called Sutter's Fort attracted a large colony of immigrants from the United States. Each year brought more wagons streaming across the mountains. The tide was rising in part because of the exploits of a man known as the Pathfinder. Captain John Charles Fremont was arrogant and reckless, but he was also one of the most famous explorers of his time. Fremont's reputation was built on the work of his wife, Jessie, a talented writer who edited his journals and reports into books that inspired thousands to head west. Our neighbors got hold of Fremont's story of California and Oregon brought the book to my husband to read, and he was carried away with the idea, too. I said, oh, let us not go. Our neighbors, some of them old men and women, had large families, but it made no difference. We sold our home, and everything we could not take with us or sell, we gave away, and joined the company for California. Mary Annie Jones. Mariano Viejo viewed the growing colony of Americans in California with mixed emotions. Vallejo knew too well what had happened in Texas once Americans had outnumbered Mexican settlers. Vallejo was fascinated with, with Americans because they represented for him a set of Republican ideals that he had been tracing uh, from his youth when he, from the time he read Rousseau. On the other hand, he also saw that Americans represented a threat uh, to the well-being of California. In December of 1845, Californios were both puzzled and concerned when Captain John Charles Fremont and 65 heavily armed men made their way out of the snow-laden mountains and into Sutter's Fort. The captain was supposed to be on a mapping mission for the U.S. government. But whatever his skills as an explorer, Fremont was no diplomat. In a dispute with local authorities, the hot-tempered captain planted a U.S. flag on a mountaintop for all to see. Californios were outraged, and Fremont avoided a fight only by heading north to Oregon. Still, the incident reinforced a hard truth for Californios. 
Their province was ripe for the taking. Mexico could not protect them. Some talked of independence, others of establishing an alliance with Britain or France. Mariano Vallejo argued that California's best hope lay in an alliance with the United States. To rely any longer upon Mexico to govern and defend us would be idle and absurd. Why should we shrink from incorporating ourselves with the happiest and freest nation in the world, destined soon to be the most wealthy? Vallejo's good opinion of Americans would soon be put to the test. Three months after planting his flag in the mountains, Captain John Fremont came riding back to Sutter's Fort. By now, the U.S. settlers in the area were anxious and angry, certain they would be forced to leave California. No one knows for sure whether Fremont was acting under orders or on his own, but the captain suggested a plan. If the settlers took a few influential Californios prisoner, perhaps they could start a chain of events that would end with California under U.S. control. In the early dawn of June 14, 1846, Mariano Vallejo was awakened by a band of American settlers pounding on his door. One of them later described his companions. Almost the whole party was dressed in leather hunting shirts. Many of them were greasy. They were about as rough looking a set of men as one could well imagine. Anyone would feel some dread at falling into their hands. Dressed in his military uniform, Vallejo faced the group. To what happy circumstances, Vallejo is reported to have said, shall I attribute the visit of so many exalted personages? The men declared that they were establishing an independent republic in California. General Vallejo was placed under arrest and forced to sign an official surrender. The Americans then helped themselves to Vallejo's brandy and wine. Soon they were shouting at each other, locked in a drunken debate over the wording of their Declaration of Independence. Choose this day what you shall be, said one. Either we are robbers or we must be conquerors. Later that morning in the plaza, the rebels raised a homemade flag featuring a crudely fashioned grizzly bear. The robbers hoisted a piece of linen about the size of a large towel. In it was painted a red bear and a lone star. A band of ungrateful horse thieves, trappers, and runaway sailors. Rosalia Vallejo Lis. Mariano Vallejo and his brother Salvador were taken under armed escort to Sutter's Fort. Vallejo had hoped that Fremont would release them. Instead, the captain ordered them held prisoner. Salvador Viejo remembered it as a day of humiliation and betrayal. My heart grieved for my brother when the light of day allowed me to see him lying on a damp floor without coverings or even a pillow on which to rest his head. I cursed the days in which our house dispensed hospitality to a race of men deaf to the call of gratitude. So perfect strangers to good breeding. Sailing in the waters off the California coast, U.S. Commodore John D. Sloat cautiously entered Monterey Harbor. In the event of a declaration of war, his orders were to occupy California's ports and, if possible, to bring about the peaceful annexation of the territory. But when told that Fremont and the Bear Flaggers had started a rebellion, Sloat knew he had to act. Doña Maria de las Angustias de la Guerra remembered the day clearly. During the morning, the preparations could be seen. Many armed boats filled with men came ashore and took possession without any interference. There was no garrison. And I believe the only Mexican officer present was old Captain Mariano Silva. The conquest of California was not a pleasant event for the Californios. But I must confess that California was on the road to the most complete ruin. When the Bear Flaggers heard the news from Monterey, they replaced their flag with the Stars and Stripes. 
the independent Republic of California had lasted just three weeks. Five months later, in December of 1846, the exhausted soldiers of Stephen Kearney's command finally reached San Diego. The nearly 2,000 mile journey across the continent had landed them in the thick of war. Californios were fighting back against the U.S. occupation. Just 40 miles from the coast, near the village of San Pasqual, Kearney's troops had suffered heavy casualties in a clash with a company of skilled Californio lancers. But the battle at San Pasqual did little to change the course of the struggle for California. In late December, U.S. forces advanced on Los Angeles. At San Gabriel and again at La Mesa, the Californios fought bravely, but to no avail. It was the last stand made by the sons of California for the liberty and independence of their country, whose defense will always do them honor. Guillermo Prieto. By the time Mariano Vallejo learned of the fall of Los Angeles, he was back in Sonoma, still recovering from his six-week captivity at Sutter's Fort. I left Sutter's Fort half dead and arrived here almost without life. But I'm now much better. The political change has cost a great deal to my person and mind, and likewise to my property. All is lost. And the only hope for making it up is to work again. Disillusioned with the United States and with Mexico, Vallejo was still forced to choose. In the plaza in front of his home, he carefully folded his Mexican military uniforms into a neat pile and burned them. The war in the borderlands was over. But even with California and New Mexico under U.S. control, President Polk faced a frustrating predicament. He had the territories he wanted for the U.S., but he could not keep them unless Mexico surrendered. And this, Mexico would not do. But the U.S. invasion of Mexico would take place on more than one front. From Santa Fe, Colonel Alexander Donovan would lead 900 Missouri volunteers into Chihuahua. General John E. Wool would march south from San Antonio. And General Zachary Taylor would prepare his army for a major offensive here on the Rio Grande. Madam Moros, dear Julia, the two flowers you sent me come safe, but when I opened your letter, the wind blew them away, and I could not find them. Before I seal this, I will pick a wild flower off the bank of the Rio Grande and send you. Do you ever see me anymore in your dreams? I am certain that you would not know me. I am as badly sunburnt as it is possible to be. Ulysses Grant. In June of 1846, Volunteers for Zachary Taylor's army were arriving by the shipload at Brazos Santiago, the port near Matamoros. By the end of June 1846, 12,000 U.S. soldiers were camped along the Rio Grande. There were shortages of everything. Zachary Taylor now had fewer wagons than he had at Corpus Christi, yet his army had grown to three times the size. President Polk was running the war on a tight budget, and Taylor complained about the lack of support from Washington. The general's success on the battlefield had sparked talk of his running for president, and Taylor wondered aloud whether he was the victim of political intrigue. I might suppose there was an intention among the high functionaries to break me down. The large force now under my command will, from design or incompetency of others, have to return to their homes without accomplishing anything. The responsibility will be thrown on me, General Zachary Taylor. 
In spite of the shortages, Taylor pressed forward with the campaign. In July, he ordered his troops to the village of Camargo, upriver on the Rio Grande. From Camargo, Taylor planned to march on the city of Monterey to the southwest. Some of the troops traveled by river, packed into the sweltering holds of leaky steamers. Others suffered through a brutal journey overland. We marched with a burning sun overhead and burning sand beneath our feet. Not a drop of rain had fallen, and the dust hung over our heads with smothering denseness from which there was no escape. In Camargo, the soldiers found no relief. The town was surrounded by limestone rock that radiated a stifling heat. The drinking water had been contaminated by a springtime flood. Most of the volunteers knew nothing about camp sanitation. Many became sick. Soon, they started to die. Men who had left their homes to sacrifice themselves in glorious battle died instead from diarrhea and dysentery. Scarcely a day elapsed that the muffled drums did not announce the departure of one or more poor fellows to the chaparral. The dead march was ever in our ears. Another young officer named George McClellan was horrified. They die, he said, like dogs. Soldiers reported that the death march was heard so often that mockingbirds whistled it back to the troops as they passed by. One out of every eight soldiers, 1,500 in all, perished at Camargo. Almost as many as would die in battle during the entire war. On the 19th of August, 1846, the first of Zachary Taylor's troops left Camargo for Monterey. The march was unbearably hot, but Major Philip Barber consoled himself with thoughts of his wife, Maddie. A few months earlier, the two had been together in Galveston, Texas. Never in my life have I enjoyed so much happiness. My dear Maddie was perfectly overcome with joy and seemed to cling to me during the whole stay with her as though a separation would be death. God grant that this war may soon terminate and we may again be permanently united. September 4th. No letters today from my husband. I expect he is on the march for Monterey. The next arrival will, I hope, bring me word of his safe arrival there. Zachary Taylor had been forced to march from Camargo with only 6,600 troops. Almost half the army had been left behind. Many of the volunteers were still sick and pack animals were scarce. To his great embarrassment, Lieutenant Ulysses Grant had been assigned to manage the mule trains. I'm not aware of ever having used a profane expletive in my life. But I would have the charity to excuse those who may have done so, if they were in charge of a train of Mexican pack mules at the time. At Monterey, the city prepared to defend itself. The provincial capital of 10,000 had been reinforced with more than 7,000 soldiers led by General Pedro de Ampudia. Ampudia and many of his troops had fought at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. Here, they were determined to stop the invaders. On September 15th, with the U.S. Army less than a week's march from the gates of the city, Monterrey celebrated the eve of Mexico's Independence Day. As night fell, we faced an enemy proud of its victories in the midst of our own fears. A night when our most tender memories of home and independence were revived. The military bands announced the solemn hour in which our birth as a nation was proclaimed. All bowed to the sentiment of patriotism. They forgot all else and longed for the fight, for revenge, and for glory. 
Guillermo Prieto. On the 19th of September, camped in a shady grove the soldiers called Walnut Springs, Taylor and his generals went over their strategy. The U.S. Army was deep in enemy territory, facing a city of well-protected defenders. Taylor decided on a risky plan. He would split his army into two. While Taylor directed a diversionary attack on the city's east side, General William Worth would attack the west. There, Worth would capture the high ground on two hills called Federation and Independence. The road to Saltillo would be cut off, and with it, any hope of Mexican reinforcements. That night, Major Philip Barber and his fellow soldiers prepared for battle. The city has to be carried, and the bayonet will probably have to do the work. We must anticipate immense slaughter, but I feel calm and collected, having long since made up my mind that my life is the rightful property of my country and cannot be taken from me or preserved except by the fiat of the great God who gave it, Major Philip Barber. On the morning of the 21st, U.S. troops launched the diversionary attack on the city's east side. Almost immediately, Taylor's plan fell apart. Inexperienced commanders charged too close to the defending positions, leading their men into a murderous crossfire. Mexican guns swept the field from three directions. Our soldiers charged over the barricades, over the bodies of our enemies, over the haze of tainted blood, rose to the heavens the triumphant shouts of Viva Mexico! Three hundred ninety-four U.S. soldiers were killed or wounded. Among the dead was Major Philip Barber. Some wrote that he was killed instantly, shot through the heart. Others said that in his last moments, he thought of Maddie. When struck by the ball that caused his death, he immediately drew from his bosom his wife's miniature, opened it, and exclaimed, Tell her I died on the field of victory put it to his lips, and instantly expired. Captain Kirby Smith. While the unexpectedly bloody fighting raged on the city's east side, General Worth's troops attacked both Federation and Independence Hills on the west. The battles were hard fought. Later, a Texas Ranger would say, I have never called a Mexican a coward since. Mexican defenders on top of Independence Hill raked the U.S. troops with cannon and musket fire from a large fortified building called the Bishop's Palace. Our men took after the infantry. The Texans were invaluable and brave as lions. They pursued so hotly that they entered pell-mell with the enemy into the palace before they could close their doors. The Mexican tricolor flag was hauled down and soon the star-spangled banner waved. Lieutenant Napoleon Dana. With the road to Saltillo cut off, U.S. troops now penetrated Monterrey from both the east and the west, fighting their way street by street towards the center. The houses were made of stone. Each had become a small fortress. Mexican defenders fired from rooftops and windows. Bullets rattled like hail on the street. One soldier said it was as if bushels of hickory nuts were being hurled on them. Amid the chaos, soldiers remembered isolated acts of mercy as though they had occurred in a dream. I saw a Mexican female carrying water and food to the wounded men of both armies. I saw her lift the head of one poor fellow, give him water and then take her handkerchief from her own head and bind up his wounds. I heard the crack of one or two guns, and she, poor good creature, fell. She was dead. I turned my eyes to heaven and thought, Oh God, and this is war. By mid-afternoon, 
the U.S. soldiers had nearly reached the central plaza. Shells were landing dangerously close to the cathedral, where explosive ammunition had been stored. That night, General Ampudia requested a truce. Taylor demanded complete surrender, but promised generous terms. Ampudia made the most of the opportunity, persuading Taylor to agree to an eight-week armistice. The Mexican soldiers were allowed to keep all their arms except the heavy cannon. On September 25th, the Mexican army withdrew from Monterrey. The departure of the Mexican army must have been dramatic, terrible. Perhaps it reminds me a bit of the departure from Tenochtitlan at the end of the siege of Hernán Cortés. That ailing and tattered caravan dragging along in misery, carrying its sick, its wounded, and suffering the want of everything that would allow it to fulfill a denigrating, terrible agreement. Honorable, perhaps, but terrible. When President Polk received news of the armistice, he was furious. If General Taylor had captured the Mexican army and deprived them of their arms, it would have probably ended the war with Mexico. But the president was forced to swallow his disappointment. The rest of the nation celebrated the Battle of Monterey as a glorious victory. Printmakers, songwriters, and playwrights commemorated the battle in a grand and romantic style. Especially popular was the Maid of Monterey. The moon was shining brightly upon the battle plain. The gentle breeze fanned lightly the features of the slain. The guns had hushed their thunder, the trumpet silence lay. Senorita, the maid of Monterey. But for the families of the Mexican and U.S. dead, there was no romance to be found in war. The poor private died unnoticed and unknown. Yet by some quiet hearthstone far from the tumult of cities, tears will be shed for his fall. The stern old father will nerve himself to his loss by the thought that the sacrifice was made for his country, while the aged mother's heart bleeds with a wound time cannot heal. Thomas Bangs Thorpe. In December of 1846, a grieving widow in Galveston, Texas, read a letter from Monterey. Mrs. Philip N. Barber, my dear friend, may God grant you support and consolation under the weighty affliction that has befallen you. The loss you have sustained is alike irreparable to the regiment and the country. By the fall of 1846, there were some in Mexico who had started to wonder if God had turned his back on their country. It seemed the United States invasion could not be stopped. Still, Mexico would neither surrender nor negotiate. In the United States, President James K. Polk needed desperately to bring the war to an end. A new strategy was required, something bold and decisive. An assault on the very heart of Mexico, Mexico City itself. The operation would be carried out by a man many considered the most brilliant soldier in the United States Army, General Winfield Scott. But between Scott and Mexico City would stand the one person able to unite Mexico and turn back the invader. The exiled general and former president of Mexico Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana.
For Mexico, 1846 had been a year of bitter defeat. U.S. General Zachary Taylor's forces had routed the Mexican army in Texas and crossed the Rio Grande. There were other losses. U.S. President James K. Polk had sent Stephen Kearney's Army of the West to occupy New Mexico. Within months, California would fall too. But for Mexico, 1846 would also be the year of the return of exiled president Antonio Lopez de Santana. Soon, Santana would meet Zachary Taylor on a barren windswept plateau in the Battle of Buena Vista. And Polk would open a second front, invading Mexico by sea. If necessary, he would strike the very heart of the country, Mexico City itself, the fabled halls of Montezuma. In August of 1846, a ship from Havana, Cuba, carved its way through the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, bound for Veracruz. On board was a man who was convinced that he would be the savior of his country. He was the exiled former president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santana. The Mexican government of Mariano Paredes had just fallen, and Santa Ana's supporters were clamoring for his return. We need a general, a general who would be able to organize an army without money, who has enough, let's say it in whatever way, charisma to attract soldiers and get them to fight without pay, without training, without anything, and who is able to unite certain groups. Earlier that year, Santana had sent a confidential agent to U.S. President James K. Polk with a surprising proposal. If Polk would allow him to pass through the U.S. blockade of Mexico, Santana would try to bring about the sale of California to the United States. The terms of the offer were vague, and Santana was still hated in the United States by those who remembered the Alamo and Goliath. But in spite of his doubts, Polk agreed to the proposal. When you face Santa Ana with Polk, you're facing one opportunist with another. They're, they both have that characteristic as a part of their makeup. And if Santa Ana was returning to Mexico without any clear idea of what he was going to do, Polk was using Santa Ana deliberately to gain something that he had not been able to gain any other way, that is, negotiations with Mexico. Of course, what he did not foresee was that Santa Ana would rally his people. This was the danger, but Polk didn't realize what a danger it was. Now, after a year and a half in exile, Santana was returning home. On Polk's orders, the U.S. Navy allowed him to pass through the blockade. In Veracruz, Santana greeted the small crowd that had gathered to welcome him home. Mexicanos, there was once a day you called me the soldier of the people. Allow me to assume that title again and to devote myself until death to the defense of liberty and to the independence of the Republic. The homecoming was uneasy. Not two years earlier, Santa Ana's abuse of presidential power had caused an angry mob to smash his statue, exhume the leg he had lost to war, and drag it through the streets of Mexico City. Now, there were already rumors that Santa Ana might have made a deal with Polk. La gente no sabe si es cierto. The people don't know if it is true, but the politicians don't have confidence in Santa Ana. And this is another vulnerable point for Mexico. 
van a tener desconfianza los políticos. Because the politicians aren't going to trust the general and commander of the Mexican army. A serious thing in a state of war. Even so, Santa Ana had become the only leader who could unite the country and stop the U.S. invasion. In December of 1846, just three months after his return from exile, he was elected president of Mexico again. In the entire United States Army, one man stood out as the general most able to win the war with Mexico. President Polk disliked him with a passion. His name was Winfield Scott. He was the Army's General-in-Chief, a hero of the War of 1812 and a superior strategist, Scott had twice gone abroad to study European military tactics. Some found him brilliant and entertaining, yet he struck others as impossibly pompous and vain. Ulysses Grant once remarked that the General always wore all the uniform allowed by law. Technically, he was far more accomplished a soldier than Taylor had been. But in contrast to the nickname of Old Rough and Ready or Old Zack for Taylor, Scott was unfortunately known as Old Fuss and Feathers because he loved military panoply. And he loved uniforms. He loved to have his staff with him and, oh, gosh. So therefore, when he got in trouble, uh, people just enjoyed his uh, discomfort. By the fall of 1846, Polk was convinced he had to open a second front against Mexico. He needed a commander. Polk despised Scott personally and feared him politically. Scott was a member of the opposing Whig party. For as long as he could, Polk had kept Scott behind a desk in Washington. But now the president needed the general's talent as a soldier. Reluctantly, Polk gave Scott command of the operation. He was so grateful and so much affected that he almost shed tears. He left apparently the most delighted man I have seen for a long time, James K. Polk. From the beginning, Winfield Scott had argued that only a major campaign against Mexico City itself would force the Mexicans to surrender. He would do it the way Cortez had defeated the Aztecs, land an army on the coast at Veracruz and fight his way 250 miles up the national highway and into the capital. Scott knew he had to move quickly. Veracruz was known to suffer devastating epidemics of malaria and yellow fever in late spring. An invading army would have to capture Veracruz and move to higher ground before then. The general needed troops immediately. The most available and most experienced were Zachary Taylor's soldiers in northern Mexico. Taylor had established his headquarters in the provincial capital of Saltillo, 75 miles southwest of Monterey. In January of 1847, he received a letter from Scott. My dear general, I shall be obliged to take from you most of the gallant officers and men whom you have so long and nobly commanded, General Winfield Scott. Taylor was so upset, an aide saw him mistakenly spoon mustard into his coffee. Such a decimation of my army had never crossed my mind. The idea of a further advance with the remaining forces is too preposterous to be entertained for a moment. General Zachary Taylor, even at full strength, Taylor's army had always been outnumbered. Now, with his troops reduced to 5,000 inexperienced volunteers, the general knew he was dangerously exposed. What he did not know was that Santana was aware of it too. By this time in January of 1847, Santana was in San Luis Potosí, north of Mexico City, where he had managed to raise an army of 20,000 soldiers. Bystanders watched as officers hastily organized recruits so inexperienced 
Many had never held a gun. The troops were not ready, but Santa Ana felt he had to take the field. He was still the target of suspicious rumors concerning his deal with Polk. Critics were questioning why he had not yet fought the invaders. The general had learned from captured documents of Scott's planned invasion at Veracruz. Now he faced a crucial decision. The landing at Veracruz would have to be stopped, but a quick victory first over Taylor's weakened forces would silence those who still questioned his leadership. To march north in the middle of winter was a gamble, but Santana was willing to accept the risk. Now was the time to meet Taylor's army and destroy it. Saltillo lies on the slope of a hill. The cathedral occupies one side. Its 15 bells chime sweetly. After a hard and dusty march, we enter with music and colors flying. The Mexicans looked daggers and doubtless had them, but did not dare to draw them. Lieutenant John James Peck. When the North Americans arrive to Saltillo, when the North Americans arrive in Saltillo at the end of 1846, the citizens receive them coldly. They all close their doors and put black ribbons or bows of mourning on them in honor of the Mexican soldiers who had died at Monterrey. And the soldiers enter and occupy the center of the city. During the U.S. occupation of Saltillo, soldiers and civilians became more accustomed to one another. And Lieutenant John Peck found time to appreciate his surroundings. The ladies of Saltillo are pretty, have elegant forms and move with that ease and grace so peculiar to the Castilians. Oftentimes, they strike the light guitar in going to my meals, I pass some beautiful creatures. All I can say is, buenos dias, buenos tardes. No less romantic, but considerably more daring, was a volunteer from Boston, Private Sam Chamberlain. As a boy, Chamberlain had intended to study theology, but instead became a self-described rogue who loved fighting and women in equal measure. He was a self-taught artist, and in his later years wrote a lavishly illustrated account of his adventures during the war. According to what he called his confession, Chamberlain never missed a Mexican Fandango, never fought a man he didn't beat, and rarely met a woman who could resist his charm. But Chamberlain was also a keen observer. And in his recollections, he described horrifying incidents of wartime violence. Amid the settled routine of occupation life, death would come suddenly, without warning. Mexican guerrilla fighters would sweep down on US supply trains or pick off individual soldiers, leaving the dead mutilated beyond recognition. Mexican civilians found themselves caught between both sides. Many of the people living in the small towns, ranches, haciendas, and farms suffered attacks by the Mexican guerrilla fighters because they thought the people were aiding the North American army. And at times, the North Americans attacked them, burned and destroyed their buildings because they thought the people were helping the guerrilla forces. It was a situation the civilians could not win. As the occupation wore on, Taylor found it hard to keep discipline in the ranks. 
Chamberlain wrote that the most abusive and violent soldiers were the volunteers from the southern states. Looking upon the greasers as belonging to the same social class as their own Negro slaves, they plundered and ill-treated them. We were obliged to patrol the country for miles around camp to protect the wretched inhabitants and arrest these heroes. On one of the occasions when Mexican civilians fought back and killed a U.S. soldier, the volunteers from Arkansas, known as Rackensackers, sought revenge. Sam Chamberlain was on patrol when he heard gunfire in the hills. Cries of women and children reached our ears, coming from a cave at the end of the ravine. A horrid sight was before us. The cave was full of our volunteers yelling like fiends, while on the rocky floor lay over 20 Mexicans, dead and dying in pools of blood. Taylor was outraged by the massacre and ordered the Rackensackers to return home in disgrace. But before they could leave, U.S. scouts reported a large Mexican army approaching from the south. It was Santana, and Taylor would need every man he had. It was mid-February of 1847. For three weeks, Santa Ana and his army had suffered an agonizing journey north through the desolate countryside. Second Lieutenant Manuel Balbantin had survived the Battle of Monterey. Now he feared he would freeze to death. It's bitter cold, windy and snowing. Last night, some of the soldiers and the women died. The troops, hungry and numb from the cold, refused to march. Illness, desertion, and death had taken a terrible toll. Of the 20,000 who had started the march, only 15,000 remained. Traveling with the soldiers were an unknown number of women who had chosen to march with the army and care for their men. Esas mujeres que a pie these women travel on foot, carrying babies on their backs, carrying small grills for cooking, accompanying the soldiers. And many times, they also die. They die of hunger, they die of sickness, they die of abandonment. Still, Santana pushed his troops relentlessly north, hoping to surprise Taylor's army at Agua Nueva, south of Sotillo. But the U.S. general was waiting for him. At a place where the road to Saltillo ran through a narrow pass, the Mexicans called La Angostura. The U.S. soldiers called it Buena Vista, after a nearby hacienda. The position was well chosen. The plateau was deeply furrowed, surrounded by hills and gullies. The broken ground would hamper Santa Ana's best troops, the cavalry. The hills would be almost impossible to take. So uh, it was defensible. If you'd hold those heights, and uh, it's easy to hold down by the gulches, uh, you could defend yourself against a much larger force, which is exactly what Taylor did uh, on the very strong advice of John E. Wool, who was a very, very excellent soldier. That night, a terrible winter storm blew over the troops, blasting overhead with thunder and lightning. Both sides lay on their weapons, without fires, shivering in the icy wind. The next day dawned clear and cold. Taylor's troops could see that they were outnumbered three to one. Most of them were volunteers who had never seen battle. Reveille sounded along the Mexican lines. Private Sam Chamberlain watched in awe as the call passed from unit to unit. A procession of ecclesiastical dignitaries, with all the gorgeous paraphernalia of the Catholic Church, advanced along the lines, preceded by the bands playing a solemn anthem. 
Their cavalry was magnificent. Some 6,000 in uniforms of blue, faced with red, with waving plumes and glittering weapons, advanced toward us as if they would ride down our little band and finish the battle in one blow. Private Sam Chamberlain. Early that morning, Santa Ana launched his attack. Mexican troops led by General Manuel Maria Lombardini burst out of a broad ravine and charged against the U.S. line. Breaking through the U.S. position, the Mexican army took the offensive and swept east across the plain. Mexican soldiers advanced along the foot of the mountains and circled around the U.S. troops to seal off the road behind them. Instead, they met the Mississippi Rifles, led by Colonel Jefferson Davis. The regiment had linked up with another from Indiana to create an open-ended V formation. As the Mexican troops charged between the lines, the U.S. soldiers cut them down. Later that day, Santa Ana called up his reserves and ordered an all-out assault. But once again, the U.S. artillery proved its worth. Batteries tore into the Mexican troops with a deadly hail of canister and grape. And the Mexican attack stalled. As night fell, both sides were exhausted. Many went to sleep wondering how they could survive another day. The evening of the 23rd uh, must have been a uh, pretty gloomy evening for Taylor sitting there at uh, Buena Vista because his troops were spent his, from the day's fighting. He knew that in spite of the fact that they had repulsed all of Santa Ana's attacks, uh, he was still vastly outnumbered and the reinforcements had not come up in any substantial uh, numbers. He had every reason to uh, feel that the next day was going to be a very, very tough day. Early the next morning, the U.S. soldiers looked out over the battlefield. The Mexican army was gone. They fell back to Agua Nueva, and Santana mentions in his battle report that he does this because the soldiers are exhausted. They have not eaten for two days. They had not been able to eat during the battle, nor have they had water. So he decides to return to Agua Nueva and plans, he says, to attack again in a few days. In fact, he does not. For Santana, the triumph that had seemed so certain the day before had become a wasted opportunity. The field belonged to Zachary Taylor and his army of volunteers. It would be Taylor's last battle of the campaign, a victory that would make him a hero at home. Still, the U.S. casualties at Buena Vista were the highest of the war so far. 659 men dead or wounded. The Mexican army fared much worse, more than 1,600 casualties. The trail of wounded soldiers stretched all the way to Agua Nueva and beyond. As night fell, many faced a terrible fate. Men abandoned in a desert, steeped in their own blood, shivering with cold, parched with thirst. On their faces the appalling calm of despair. In sight already were the coyotes and dogs who awaited the moment when they might begin their frightful banquet. The first news to reach San Luis Potosí from the battlefield at Langostura reported a Mexican victory. People rejoiced in the streets as cathedral bells announced special masses of thanksgiving. But when the remnants of Santana's battered army finally returned, the truth was easy to see. The march north had been disastrous. 
the trip back even worse. Half the soldiers that had started out just six weeks earlier were either dead, wounded, or missing. For Santa Ana, there was no time to rest. In Mexico City, a revolt had broken out against his vice president, Valentin Gomez Farias. Desperate for money to fight the war, Gomez Farias had tried to force the church to contribute more funds. In response, National Guard units, backed partly by the church, took to the streets in protest. Many of the rebel officers were from the upper class. The people called them polkos, after the polka, the dance then in fashion among the wealthy. For Mexico, the Polkos Rebellion could not have come at a worse time. The possibility of creating a united front among the different political groups in Mexico is gone. So now anything is possible. Obviously, what is in imminent danger is the very survival of the country as a nation. That's what's at stake. Even as the government was falling apart, Mexico faced yet another crisis. Off the coast of Veracruz, General Winfield Scott was prepared to launch an invasion of the country. 10,000 soldiers anxiously eyed the coastline. It would be the first major amphibious landing ever attempted by U.S. armed forces. The operation was risky, the consequences of failure devastating, and Scott knew that the odds against him were overwhelming. He had to land an army, establish a supply base, uh, march 250 miles inland, seize the capital of a hostile nation, thereby bring about uh, a peace, conquering a peace, not conquering a nation. Now that's a very, very tall order. And it was, as I said before, unprecedented practically in history. In Veracruz, the commanding officer, General Juan Morales, appealed to Mexico City for reinforcements. But the government could not respond. The Polcos revolt had paralyzed the capital. What madness had seized the Mexicans to provoke a civil war while a foreign enemy was lording over our cities and occupying our territory? Veracruz resigned herself to her fate. On the morning of March 9, 1847, the day dawned clear and calm. Scott decided the time had come. U.S. soldiers clambered over the rails of the transport ships into surf boats Scott had designed for the landing. Packed shoulder to shoulder, the men braced themselves for what they knew would be a terrible battle on the beach. At 5.30 in the afternoon, a gun sounded from Scott's flagship. The invasion began. Soon, the first U.S. soldiers scrambled through the surf and onto the beach. To their amazement, not a shot was fired. General Morales and his troops remained behind the thick, fortified walls of Veracruz, hoping to hold out until help could arrive. For the next 12 days, Scott's troops surrounded the city with batteries of heavy guns and mortars. On March 22nd, Scott sent an ultimatum to General Morales. Morales refused to surrender. The following day, a battery of six heavy naval cannons replied with a volley of exploding shells that arched high into the air before raining down on the city. The guns had been placed by a 40-year-old Army engineer from Virginia named Robert E. Lee. The shells thrown from our battery were constant and regular discharges, so beautiful in their flight and so destructive in their fall. It was awful. My heart bled for the inhabitants. 
The soldiers I did not care so much for, but it was terrible to think of the women and children. The shelling continued day and night. Deadly fires broke out everywhere. The surgical hospital in the convent of Santo Domingo suffered from the fire. During an operation on a wounded man, a shell extinguished the lights, and when other lights were brought, the patient was found torn in pieces, and many others dead and wounded. Jose Maria Castillo Velasco. For three harrowing days and nights, U.S. guns poured an estimated 6,700 shells into the city. By the fourth day, priests no longer dared to venture out to minister to the dead and dying. Finally, the people could take no more. Veracruz surrendered. In Mexico City, the satirical press criticized the government and the military's inability to turn back the U.S. invasion. The capital was still reeling from the Polcos revolt. Once again, it was Santana who was able to temporarily unite the country's divided leadership. The president promised to protect the church from its enemies in the government in exchange for a loan to help fund the war. The scholar and politician Jose Fernando Ramirez criticized the church's loan as too little and too late. Two months before, with this sum of money, the clergy could have undoubtedly redeemed themselves. They could have saved Veracruz and our nation, and at the same time, saved the 300,000 pesos which they used in a civil war. A war which is going to cost us very dearly. Santana now faced another, even more serious threat. General Winfield Scott and his army would soon be on the march toward the capital. On April 2nd, as crowds of well-wishers lined the streets, Santana left Mexico City with 6,000 troops. Before his departure, he issued a public proclamation, words he hoped would finally unify the nation. Mexicanos, Veracruz calls for vengeance. Follow me and wash out the stain of her dishonor. To our shame be it said, we ourselves have produced this deplorable misfortune by our interminable discords. Mexicanos, the national cause is infinitely just, although God appears to have abandoned us. The hour of sacrifice has sounded its approach. Your fate is the fate of the nation, not the Americanos, but you will decide her destiny. In early April, Santana arrived at his hacienda El Encerro. In the past, El Encero had been Santana's refuge from the world of politics and war. Now, it became his military headquarters. The estate was 70 miles up the National Road from Veracruz, directly in the path of Scott's advancing army. Here, on his own ground, Santana planned to meet the U.S. invasion and drive Scott's army back to the coast, where yellow fever would finish the job. Not far from his hacienda, in the rugged hills near the village of Cerro Gordo, Santana positioned 12,000 troops. Mexican forces now blocked the road to Mexico City at a point where it cut between steep hills on one side and a ravine that tumbled into a river on the other. It's on high ground, flanks well protected on the river on the right and supposedly impassable terrain on the left. Uh, his selection of that piece of ground was, I believe, uh, close to masterful. The position was strong, but the troops were poorly deployed. Santana's officers warned that the enemy might try and circle around them. One of the general's most experienced engineers, Lieutenant Colonel Juan Cano, recommended placing artillery on a nearby hill called La Atalaya. 
Santana ridiculed the advice. In almost all of the military operations that he conducts throughout his military career, one can see him imposing his will on others. It was also a product of this arrogance that drove him. I am the only one, the best. And this happens when people come under the influence of that terrible drug called power. On April 14th, Winfield Scott reached the pass at Cerro Gordo. His troops numbered 8,500 against Santana's 12,000. Some of Scott's officers recommended a frontal assault. Instead, Scott looked for a way to do exactly what Colonel Juan Cano feared he would, circle around the Mexican forces and cut off the road behind them. But the ground was unfamiliar Scott ordered one of his best engineers, Captain Robert E. Lee, to scout the area. At dawn the next day, Lee slipped quietly out of camp to find a path through the steep ravines. In the course of his reconnaissance, Lee got so close to the Mexican lines that he all of a sudden got trapped there at one point, and he had to lie behind a uh, log for hours while the Mixon sat there on the same log he was hiding behind and chatted and drew their water and went back. To, he was that close. We almost lost a good, a good officer there, but the information he brought back as a result of that was extremely valuable. Lee's drawings showed Scott that there was a way around the Mexican flank. That night, Scott ordered guns placed on the hill Santana had refused to fortify himself, La Atalaya. At 7 a.m., the U.S. battery on La Atalaya opened fire, taking the Mexican troops completely by surprise. Our whole force, with a loud shout, left the breastwork and met the Mexicans at the point of the bayonet. Here, for just one short minute, ensued a kind of fighting I hope I never see again. It seemed like murder to see men running bayonets into each other's breasts. By 10 a.m., the fighting was over. U.S. soldiers took more than 3,000 Mexican troops prisoner. Eleven years earlier, Santana had been captured in Texas. Desperate to avoid falling into enemy hands again, he raced toward the safest place he could think of, his home, El Encierro. But U.S. cavalry fire forced him to change direction and run to wherever he could find a place to hide. Santa Ana, the first chief of our nation and our army, a few hours before erect and proud, was now humbled and confused seeking among the wretched a refuge to flee to. U.S. soldiers found Santana's carriage and an artificial leg with its boots still attached. News of the discovery spread quickly to the United States, where miniature replicas of the leg became popular souvenirs. To General Scott, the U.S. victory seemed complete. Mexico, he wrote, no longer has an army. Well, Cerro Gordo should have ended the war. If you'd had a nation that was less determined and a, a president who was less determined than Santa Ana, probably anybody in their right mind would have sued for peace then. The, the Mexican army was destroyed. The path was open to Mexico City. Santana had suffered one of the worst defeats of his life. Still, he would not give up. Even as Scott's victory message was making its way to Washington, the Mexican general set about reorganizing the scattered remnants of his army. He was capable of defying all of these incredible challenges. So he says, all right, I have to defend the Valley of Mexico, Mexico City. And he sets out. He sets out to do the impossible. For Santa Ana, the disaster at Cerro Gordo was already nothing more than a memory. The defense of Mexico City would give him another chance to prove himself a soldier of the people. The war was far from over.
Dear father, what could have possessed you to send me way off here? Your notions of military glory are altogether too exalted. There is no fun in cutting throats. I've tried it. I am obliged to mother for her advice, but it's no use to read the Bible in the midst of swords and bayonets. Either I am or that book is wrong. Anonymous letter published in Yankee Doodle. As the war with Mexico dragged on, voices of protest began to appear in U.S. newspapers, pamphlets, and magazines. Most people still supported the war, but many had expected the fighting to be over within a few months. Now, with costs and casualties mounting, opposition politicians attacked the president, denouncing what they contemptuously called Mr. Polk's War. Polk fought back, questioning the patriotism of those who criticized him. A more effectual means could not have been devised to encourage the enemy and protract the war than to advocate and adhere to their cause and thus give them aid and comfort. Much of the opposition came from anti-slavery forces who believed that the war was part of a southern scheme to expand slavery. Among those who opposed the president was the abolitionist leader and former slave, Frederick Douglass. The determination of our slave-holding president to prosecute the war and the probability of his success in wringing from the people men and money to carry it on is made evident by the puny opposition arrayed against him. None seem willing to take their stand for peace at all risks. Another outspoken critic of the war with Mexico was the then little-known Massachusetts writer, Henry David Thoreau. In an essay later called On Civil Disobedience, Thoreau challenged Americans to follow their conscience. When a sixth of the population of a nation which has undertaken to be a refuge of liberty are slaves, and a whole country is overrun and conquered by our foreign army and subjected to military law, I think it is not too soon for honest men to rebel and revolutionize. This people must cease to hold slaves and to make war on Mexico. But the protests of anti-war activists like Thoreau had little influence on the general public. And the embattled president now seemed more determined than ever. I declared to the cabinet that no alternative was now left but the most energetic crushing movement of our arms upon Mexico. I would not only march to the city of Mexico, but I would pursue Santa Ana's army wherever it was and capture or destroy it. Set beneath the twin volcanic peaks of Popocatépetl and Ixtaccíhuatl, Puebla de Los Ángeles, with 60,000 residents, was Mexico's second largest city. Located midway between Veracruz and the capital, Puebla was famous for its many beautiful churches. Now it found itself in the path of war. On May 15, 1847, the first U.S. troops arrived. At 12 o'clock precisely, the vanguard of the invading army entered the south gate and marched to the Grand Plaza fronting the cathedral. They stacked their arms and supplied themselves with water from a fountain, a Carolina volunteer. The streets were swarming with the multitude as far as the eye could reach. Our little army of 4,000 was completely lost in the crowds that pressed around us, examining us pretty much as they would the animals in a menagerie. Captain Kirby Smith. With the occupation of Puebla in place, Scott took the time to rest and reorganize his troops. Some took advantage of the opportunity to walk the streets of the beautiful old city. 
Many a New England Congregationalist or Ohio Methodist was astonished by the opulence of a Poblana church. And at Cholula, just outside Puebla, U.S. soldiers marveled at the sight of a gigantic pyramid more than a thousand years old. It was raised by the Toltec people to honor their god, Quetzalcoatl. Later, the Spaniards built a Catholic church on top. Many of the soldiers had read about Cholula in a popular book called The Conquest of Mexico by William Prescott. Many soldiers carried copies of the, of the book with them. They used it as a kind of guidebook, and they wanted to, keep, they wanted to visit all of the sites uh, that Cortez had, had been identified with, that they'd read about uh, in, uh, in Prescott's book. And when our flag has been upheld and crushed lies each presume, uh, Inspired by their role in what they saw as a grand historical drama, U.S. soldiers picnicked atop Cholula and dreamed of glory. To conquer the descendants of the Spanish conquerors and to plant the flag of our young republic upon the capital reared centuries ago above the ruins of Montezuma's palaces, what prospect more captivating to the youthful imagination? But there were others, like Lieutenant John Peck, who looked ahead and saw that if glory came, it would come at a price. Our force is small, but not quite 10,000, with an inadequate siege train and small supply of ammunition. I am confident we cannot be beaten, but we must oppose great odds and decide by the bayonet. In April of 1847, President James K. Polk made one of the most important decisions of the war. He would send a diplomat to travel with Winfield Scott's army. His name was Nicholas Trist. He was second in command at the State Department. He had served as U.S. Consul in Cuba and was fluent in Spanish. Trist was also well connected in Washington. He was married to Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter and had worked closely with Presidents Andrew Jackson and James Madison. The diplomat's assignment was to accomplish what the invasion so far had been unable to achieve, successful negotiations with Mexico. Unfortunately, he was a man with a very thin skin and a man of a uh, uh, rather hot temper and a compulsive writer who wrote long dispatches and long letters in which he said many things that he should not have said. On May 6, 1847, Nicholas Trist disembarked at Veracruz. Almost immediately, he managed to offend Winfield Scott. Trist sent a sealed peace proposal to Scott's headquarters, instructing Scott to pass it on to Mexican officials. But Triss did not bother to inform the general of the proposal's details, and Scott was incensed at the thought of being bypassed. The Secretary of War proposes to degrade me by requiring that I, the commander of this army, shall defer to you, the chief clerk of the Department of State. The question of an armistice or no armistice is most peculiarly a military question appertaining of necessity to the commander of the invading forces. The safety of this army demands no less. General Winfield Scott. Trist's reply took six days to compose and filled 30 pages. The course determined upon by our government is what any man of plain common sense would take for granted that it must be and it is not what your exuberant fancy and over-cultivated imagination would make. If you dare to use this style of address again, or indulge yourself in a single discourteous phrase, I shall throw back the orders and instructions with the contempt and scorn which you merit at my hands. For more than a month, Scott and Trist refused to speak to one another and the peace proposal remained undelivered. Frustrated, Trist resorted to having a British diplomat pass the document to Santana. 
By now, Santana was in Mexico City, but he was in no position to respond to the proposal. The Mexican Congress had passed a law making it an act of treason for any official to negotiate with the United States. It was a measure aimed directly at Santana. Santana was facing opposition from his own generals, and uh, some of them were accusing him of uh, selling out the country or being willing to sell out to the Americans. Considering Santana's past history, it, this was not an unreasonable supposition because Santana was always out for the main chance. Esa es una situación muy curiosa, ¿no? It was a curious situation, right? On the one hand, there was a fear of this important figure, Santana, who could declare himself dictator and with one sweep of the pen abolish Congress. But on the other hand, they knew that the only person who could pull all of the remaining forces together was Santana. In Puebla, the private war between Nicholas Trist and Winfield Scott was coming to an end. In late June, Trist fell ill with dysentery, soon after sending Scott a conciliatory letter. The message satisfied Scott, who responded with a gift for the sick diplomat. My dear sir, looking over my stores, I find a box of guava marmalade which perhaps the physician may not consider improper to make part of the diet. Yours very truly, Winfield Scott. When Trist recovered and the two men finally met, they discovered they liked one another and quickly became fast friends. But Scott now faced a serious crisis. His army's supply lines stretched 200 miles through the mountains to Veracruz, Wagon trains moving along the national road were under constant attack by bandits and guerrilla fighters. Scott's solution was both simple and daring. He would cut his supply lines to the coast. From this point on, his army would live off the land. The decision astonished an old acquaintance who had been following Scott's campaign from abroad, the Duke of Wellington, victor over Napoleon at Waterloo. Scott is lost. He's been carried away by his successes. He can't take Mexico City and he can't fall back on his bases. He won't leave Mexico without the permission of the Mexicans. But for Scott, as for Cortez, who had burned his boats at Veracruz 300 years earlier, there would be no turning back. On August 5th, 1847, he ordered his army to march on Mexico City. I resolve no longer to depend on Veracruz, but to render my little army a self-sustaining machine. We had to throw away the scabbard and to advance with the naked blade in hand. They were two days into the march from Puebla, more than 10,000 feet in elevation. Tomorrow, the soldiers of Winfield Scott's army would glimpse the Valley of Mexico. There, they knew they would find Mexico City and an army led by General Antonio Lopez de Santana. As the U.S. troops shivered in the cold, a few may have reached for their copies of William Prescott's History of the Conquest of Mexico to read of what Cortez and his men had seen 300 years earlier. The Valley of Mexico, or Tenochtitlan, as more commonly called by the natives, was spread out like some gay and gorgeous panorama before them. And in the center of the Great Basin, like some Indian empress with her corona of pearls, the far-famed Venice of the Aztecs. Such was the beautiful vision which broke on the eyes of the conquerors. On August 10, 1847, General Winfield Scott and his army marched out of the mountains to discover 3,000 feet below them 
the Valley of Mexico. And near its center, the object of all our dreams and hopes, toils and dangers, once the gorgeous seat of the Montezumas. Probably not a man in the column failed to say to his neighbor or to himself, that splendid city shall soon be ours, Winfield Scott. Not all of the soldiers were as confident as their commander. Even from a distance, they could see that Mexico City would not be easy to capture. The capital was surrounded by lakes and marshes. Only six causeways crossed the waters, each entering the city at a fortified gate. Outnumbered, with no hope of reinforcements, the Americans knew that retreat would be impossible. For Captain Kirby Smith, the odds against survival were all too clear. 10,000 troops to conquer a city containing near 300,000 inhabitants. We shall do it, but perhaps pay dearly for it. Mexico must fall, or we must all find a grave. In Mexico City, church bells sent a frantic alarm echoing through the streets. The unthinkable had become a reality. The Yankee troops were approaching the capital. Since his return from Cerro Gordo, Santa Ana had worked feverishly to rebuild his army. Bells were forged into cannon and closets ransacked for old muskets. Thousands left their jobs to join the National Guard, the pride of the city. My battalion was formed by bricklayers, tailors, carpenters, in a word, craftsmen. It was called the Independencia Battalion. Our weapons were poor because, being laborers, we were only able to buy old flintlocks. Private Perfecto Falcón. Between new recruits and loyal veterans, Santa Ana managed to raise an army of more than 25,000 soldiers. Most of the troops were positioned at strategic points around the city. The rest would meet the Yankees east of the capital at El Peñon, a prominent hill overlooking the National Road. Shouts and cheers filled the air as 7,000 National Guardsmen under Santa Ana's personal command marched toward El Peñon to defend their city and their nation. Vivas to the army, to General Santana, and to the Republic rang out from all sides. The families run in masses to the streets following the troops. The brother tears himself away from his brother's arms. The wife marches at her recruit side. The blushing lover tries to appear calm, but tears give her away. The mother cries, watches, implores, for her son's safety. And the prayers and the pleas are drowned out by the monotonous sound of the military bands. Guillermo Prieto. On August 12th, the American advance guard reached a crossroads, 30 miles east of Mexico City. But to Santa Ana's surprise, Scott avoided El Peñon entirely, circling around the capital to the south. It's a turning movement. It's a classic turning movement. Uh, he has turned Mexican defenders out of their position without firing a shot. And that is, is the, the genius of Scott in this war, his ability to do that. Santa Ana quickly reformed his defenses, placing 20,000 soldiers in a five-mile line between Scott and the city. To the U.S. General's east lay soggy marshland and lakes. To the west was a massive field of hardened lava, a no-man's land of sharp, jagged rock called the Pedregal. Santa Ana now had the U.S. Army's approach to the capital blocked. The strategy might have worked, but for the actions of one of Santa Ana's rivals. General Gabriel Valencia was ambitious and powerful, and he saw victory on the battlefield as his path to the presidency. Against orders, he advanced to a position near the village of Contreras. From there, he hoped to engage the U.S. Army and win glory for himself. Valencia thought his flank was protected by what everyone knew was the impassable terrain 
of the Pedregal. But on August 19th, the Mexican general was shocked when 3,500 U.S. troops appeared out of the volcanic wasteland. On Scott's orders, Robert E. Lee had found a way across. Valencia was now in danger of being cut off from the main body of the Mexican army. Desperately, he appealed for reinforcements. But Santa Ana refused. Valencia is an insubordinate sot, Santa Ana said. Let him spike his guns and retreat. That night, U.S. troops devised a bold plan, a surprise attack on Valencia's rear. Someone was needed to cross the Pedregal and return with more troops. Robert E. Lee volunteered. Working through the night, his way illuminated only by flashes of lightning and the dim light of a lamp, Lee picked his way across the treacherous field of lava and brought reinforcements back. Scott called it the greatest feat of physical and moral courage performed by anyone during the entire campaign. At daybreak on August 20th, U.S. troops launched their attack. The battle lasted only 17 minutes. 700 Mexican soldiers were killed. 813 more were taken prisoner. Among them, four generals. What has occurred is the result of the stupidity committed by the disobedient Valencia and the inconceivable conduct of Santana when he stood by as a motionless spectator watching the ruination of his rival. It is not the first time, nor will it be the last, that the criminal desire of generals to surpass one another results in the loss of nations. Manuel Gomez Pedraza. Valencia's retreat spread panic through the Mexican ranks. Soon the road to Mexico City was crowded with fleeing soldiers. Scott's troops gave chase. The double quick was sounded and the whole advanced at a run. We soon reached the road and turned in hot pursuit. Captain Kirby Smith. The key to the Mexican army's safe retreat was the crossing at the Churubusco River. Santa Ana had ordered the bridge there held at all costs. From behind the fortified walls of a former monastery, Mexican guns raked the ground in front of the advancing U.S. troops. Immediately in front of us, at perhaps 500 yards, the roll of the Mexican fire exceeded anything I have ever heard. We were exposed to a dreadful crossfire which could scarcely be resisted. Captain Kirby Smith. Heads of columns were swept away like chaff and companies cut in pieces. Lieutenant Holloway was cut down while talking with me, and I thought of the passage, one shall be taken and another left, Lieutenant John James Peck. Slowly, the firing from the Mexican guns at the monastery and bridge began to taper off. Ammo. Where's the ammunition? Those words could be heard all over the place. Soldiers ran from one post to the next to ask their comrades if they had any cartridges. Private Perfecto Falcón. Colonel Juan Cano, the engineer who had advised Santa Ana at Cerro Gordo, was responsible for the fortification of the monastery. After a fatal delay, Santa Ana sent munitions. The soldiers rushed to them. The bullets were for weapons of a larger caliber. They say those desperate men tried to load the rifles with stones. Lieutenant Colonel Juan Cano. More than once, white flags fluttered at the monastery, only to be ripped down by soldiers from the San Patricio Battalion, American deserters who had crossed over to the Mexican side. Many of them were Irish. Most were Catholic. The San Patricio Battalion of American deserters who knew they were going to get hanged if they were captured really stiffened the backbone of the resistance and resulted in, in a more serious battle, I think, than uh, Scott had any reason to expect. Propose a truce. Scott agreed. Willing to leave something to this republic of no immediate value to us, on which to rest her pride 
I halted our victorious corps at the gates of the city. The city of Mexico was open to Scott after Churubusco. And uh, he stopped uh, for political reasons, so as to give Santa Ana a chance to survive so we could have somebody to deal with. From a rooftop in the capital, Jose Fernando Ramirez had watched the fighting. Now, along with the rest of Mexico City, he waited to see what would happen next. What frightens me is the future. I cannot even guess what will become of us. Tell my family that I'm safe and in good health. But my heart is broken. The fighting had stopped. Now the once lively streets of Mexico City were strangely quiet. Many families had departed. The doors and balconies were closed. The sight alone of the deserted city inspired sorrow and a shudder. It resembled beauty without life, and the naked bones of a skull, for lovely eyes had sparkled. Guillermo Prieto. Santana assembled the generals he still trusted. He offered his place to anyone who would take it. No one stepped forward. Now that Scott was at the gates of the capital, Santana decided to accept the United States offer to negotiate a peace. At least it would buy him time. On August 27th, U.S. diplomat Nicholas Trist and four Mexican commissioners began their negotiations. But the effort was doomed from the start. Trist could offer peace only on the condition that Mexico give up territory. And Santana could not agree without being accused of treason. No other Mexican politician dared risk his career by supporting a compromise. This inability to make a decision of this magnitude is very revealing of the political situation in Mexico at this time. Nobody is willing to run the risk of something that they know is a lost cause. Finally, a disappointed Trist broke off the talks, convinced that Santa Ana had let his last chance slip away. Santa Ana could not bring himself to take the plunge into his Rubicon and allowed himself to be carried along by a flood of circumstance, staking all upon a battle everyone felt sure he would lose. The peace talks had failed. Now the truce itself began to crumble. Scott was convinced that Santana had been using the time to fortify the city in violation of the terms of the armistice. On September 6th, he demanded that Santana surrender by noon the next day. Unable to make peace, Santana decided on the only remaining alternative. He wrote back to Scott. Yours will be the responsibility before the world, which readily will perceive whose is the part of moderation and justice. So he fights up to the last minute. And in that sense, he was like the Mexican people of the time. You have to exhaust every possibility. Once more, soldiers on both sides prepared for battle. My never forgotten and beloved Catita, although the Yankees will enter Mexico City, it does not follow that they will be the conquerors of the Mexican nation. These evil men will remain masters only of the territory they walk on, and the whole nation will rise up and destroy them. The truce was over. The battle for Mexico City would soon begin. Scott ordered his engineers to scout the causeways into the capital. There were two possible attack routes, one from the south through the gate of San Antonio, the other from the west through the gates of San Cosme and Belen. 
On the western approach was an old flour mill called Molino del Rey. Rumors spoke of stockpiles of gunpowder there and a foundry where bells were being turned into cannons. Scott ordered the mill captured. As evening touched the American camp, Captain Kirby Smith took a moment to write his wife. My dearest, I almost despair when I reflect upon the destitute situation in which you will be left with the three children dependent on you should I fall in the coming battle. Tomorrow will be a day of slaughter. I'm thankful you do not know the peril we are in. Good night. The next morning, U.S. soldiers advanced on the mill, only to be surprised by a devastating volley of Mexican artillery. Soon, 3,500 U.S. troops found themselves engaged in a desperate battle with Mexican forces numbering 10,000. The bloody fighting raged for more than two hours. Time and again, U.S. soldiers charged into the fearsome fire. Our troops fought like heroes, said Lieutenant John Peck, and were mowed like grass. The battle for Molino del Rey cost Scott's forces some 800 casualties. Among the dead was the temporary commander of the Light Infantry, Captain Kirby Smith. For Santa Ana's troops, the toll was far higher. Surprised by the persistence of the American attack, the Mexican forces slowly withdrew. As the U.S. troops searched the buildings, they were forced to accept a bitter irony. The cannon works so many had given their lives for did not exist. Inside the gates of Mexico City, the residents could only wonder when the final attack would come. The church bells, which have been silent for many days, ring only to spread the alarm. Half the inhabitants crowd the rooftops to see what their fate may be, while the other half lock themselves indoors or rush to prepare to defend themselves to the last. Jose Fernando Ramirez. Santa Ana stationed troops and artillery at the southern and western gates to the city and at Chapultepec Castle, which dominated the approach from the west. Now he waited to see from which direction the U.S. forces would launch their assault on the capital. For Winfield Scott, the stakes had never been higher. One of every five soldiers who had marched into the valley with him had fallen. Another costly battle like the one for Molino del Rey would be his last. Finally, Scott made his decision. He would attack Mexico City from the west. Against the advice of some of his officers, the general ordered an assault on Chapultepec Castle. General William Worth, one of Scott's best, most experienced commanders, had argued against an attack on Chapultepec. After the decision, he was heard to mutter, we shall be defeated. At sunrise on the next morning, September 12th, U.S. artillery began blasting at Chapultepec's walls and rooftops. The shelling lasted 14 hours, but the Mexican troops held firm. Inside the castle, General Nicolas Bravo led 832 defenders, including more than 50 cadets from the military college. As shells ripped through the castle walls, Bravo urgently appealed to Santa Ana for reinforcements, but none arrived. Santa Ana was constantly crossing the avenue, ordering soldiers to march, searching out the most dangerous places with reckless valor. I see him now with his Panama hat, whip in hand, his overcoat and pants of white as linen. His actions served no purpose, and just as he cannot be called a traitor, he cannot justly be considered a good general. Guillermo Prieto. Colonel Juan Cano, who had helped fortify the Mexican positions at Cerro Gordo and Chorobusco, worked desperately to repair Chapultepec's battered defenses. Cano knew time was running out. That night, he ordered his brother, Lorenzo, to take a sealed message to their uncle. 
It was a request for supplies, Juan Cano said, nothing more. When Lorenzo delivered the message, he learned otherwise. Querido tío, dear uncle, I am certain that tomorrow we shall die. I don't want my elderly parents to suffer the unbearable grief of learning that two sons have died at the same time. So I beg you, keep my brother Lorenzo from returning to my side. If he were here at Chapultepec, I am sure he would die with me. Juan Can. As dawn broke the next morning, the U.S. infantry advanced towards the castle. Guillermo Prieto watched as the soldiers marched through a forest dating back to the time of the Aztecs. My forest, my childhood paradise, my playground of youth. To see it bruised and wounded, trampled by the invader, tormented me as if I were seeing my father's body stepped on and humiliated. Guillermo Prieto. 500 volunteers made up the lead assault party. Following army tradition, they called themselves the Forlorn Hope. With scaling ladders in place, the men scrambled up and into the face of the Mexican guns. The Yankees climbed like goats. Clearing all the rocks and thicket, they came to the main door of the top plaza, trampling over everything. There they bumped into Colonel Cano, very resolute with gun in hand. Two of them asked for his sword. He shut their mouths with a gun. They fell on him and killed him. At the height of the battle, 400 Mexican sharpshooters from the San Blas Battalion charged up the hill in a courageous attempt to join their comrades. But the reinforcements arrived too late, and most were cut down trying to reach the castle. The assault on Chapultepec ended in bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting that spared few of the Mexican defenders. Among those who fell were some of the Mexican cadets, the youngest just 13 years old. Six, it was said, chose to die rather than surrender. They would become national heroes in Mexico, the boy heroes of Chapultepec. Legend holds that one of them, Juan Escutia, wrapped himself in Mexico's flag and plunged to his death from the castle wall. From a nearby hill, 30 of the American deserters captured at Churubusco with the San Patricio Battalion watched, standing in mule carts, with ropes around their necks. Finally, the U.S. flag was raised over the castle. Chapultepec had fallen. As the U.S. flag fluttered on the wind, the officer in charge of the execution gave the signal, and the carts lurched forward. If there's ever a case where there's two different points of view, this is one, because to the Mexicans, the uh, San Patricios are patriots. Uh, few American military have any sympathy for him. With Chapultepec Castle no longer a threat, Scott's troops battled their way up the two western causeways, taking both San Cosme and Belen gates by the end of the day. That night, Santa Ana met with his key commanders and several political leaders to decide the city's fate. I think among the most tragic moments in the history of Mexico is that night, September 13th, when the last recourse, the last possibility, or nearly the last possibility, of defending Mexico City was exhausted. And evidently for General Santa Ana, it's terrible to have to accept that he's failed again. A little after 11 o'clock, a carriage came for General Antonio Lopez de Santana. Later in the night, some 9,000 troops followed him out of the city. 
At four o'clock the next morning, September 14th, a delegation of city leaders went to Scott's headquarters and surrendered. Within hours, General Scott's army entered the Plaza de Armas, the heart of the capital, in triumph. Some resistance did come from an unexpected quarter. Santa Ana had emptied the jails, and the prisoners joined thousands of beggars and indigents coursing through the streets. Only a few had weapons. Most could only heave stones at the invaders. Sad to say, this generous effort by the lower classes was bitterly denounced by the privileged classes, people who could look with indifference on the humiliation of their country if they could only preserve their own interests and comforts. Guillermo Prieto. It's very clear to many people that if these lower class people are armed, they will conquer Scott's 10,000 soldiers and continue with a nationwide social revolution. This could not be permitted. They'd rather lose whatever there is to lose against the United States than risk a social upheaval that could wipe the privileged classes off the map. As the Americans tightened their grip on the capital, Santa Ana resigned his presidency. Manuel de la Peña y Peña, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, became president of Mexico. Within a month, Peña y Peña ordered Santa Ana court-martialed and stripped of his command. Wanted by his own government and pursued by U.S. soldiers, Santa Ana finally fled to exile in Jamaica. In a farewell message to the country, he defended himself with a familiar blend of self-pity and pride. Fellow citizens, misfortune has deprived me of the incomparable satisfaction of presenting to you a splendid victory. But never have I committed a crime against my country. A good name, when I am gone, is the height of my ambition. I have wished all that is great and glorious for Mexico. And to obtain it, I have not spared even my own blood. This you know, and will do me justice. Even with U.S. forces in control of Mexico City, Winfield Scott faced a perilous situation. The United States Army had never before occupied a foreign capital. All that had happened to now, the sacrifices on both sides, would mean nothing without a treaty. It was the moment that Peace Commissioner Nicholas Trist had been waiting for, an opportunity to claim his place in history. But before the talks could start, Trist received a stunning dispatch from Washington. He had been fired. October 6th, 1847. The president, believing that your continued presence with the army can be productive of no good, has directed me to recall you from your mission. He has determined not to make another offer to treat with the Mexican government. They must now sue for peace. James Buchanan, U.S. Secretary of State. Interim President Manuel de la Peña y Peña urged Tris to stay. For weeks, Mexican leaders had struggled to form a government stable enough to even attempt negotiations. At this time, it was necessary for the Mexicans to negotiate because they were afraid of losing all of their territory, or even more territory than that already occupied in the North and demanded by the United States. In Mexico, Trist was trusted by both sides. Without him, everyone feared the negotiations would collapse. Pressed by both Scott and Peña y Peña to remain, Trist made his decision. In a condescending 65-page letter, he informed Buchanan of his intention to disobey his president. If the present opportunity be not seized at once, all chance of making a treaty at all will be lost probably forever. 
Trist knew his response would take weeks to reach Washington, and more weeks would pass while an angry reply worked its way to Mexico. Meanwhile, he would try to negotiate a peace. The talks lasted two months, but by late January of 1848, Nicholas Trist and the Mexican peace commissioners had agreed on most of the terms of a treaty. The United States would pay Mexico $15 million. The lands of Upper California and New Mexico would be ceded to the United States. Los Mexicanos to pelearon muchísimo. The Mexicans fought very hard not to cede New Mexico. They fought to keep Southern California, which was also more inhabited by Mexicans, and above all, they fought for the area from the Nueces to the Bravo. These were the lands over which blood had first been shed. But here Trist would not give in. The border with Texas would be drawn at the Bravo, the Rio Grande. For the Mexicans living in the territory transferred to the United States, there would be a choice. They could stay on their land and choose either U.S. or Mexican citizenship, or they could leave. Most would choose to stay. The border is created, this artificial political border, and suddenly a family, part of the family is, is, is on one side, and the other, family, the other part of the family is on the other side. So it splits families, it pulls them apart and they are suddenly not only on opposite sides of the border, but politically, uh, because the war continued to be fought in many respects, although no longer militarily, um, they are now, at, in that sense, enemies, uh, although they don't construct themselves that way or they don't see themselves that way. On February 2nd, 1848, Trist and the Mexican commissioners met in the town of Guadalupe Hidalgo near the Basilica of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the patron saint of Mexico. Here they signed the document that would become known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Years later, Trist told his wife Virginia that at the time his sense of duty had forced him to hide his feelings. During the signing, one of the Mexican commissioners, Jose Bernardo Couto, remarked to Trist, this must be a proud moment for you no less proud for you than it is humiliating for us. To this, Mr. Trist replied, we are making peace, let that be our only thought. But, said he to us in relating it, could those Mexicans have seen into my heart at that moment, they would have known that my feeling of shame as an American was far stronger than theirs could be. The treaty arrived in Washington on February 19th. Polk was still incensed at Trist's insubordination. But the president was also worried that extreme expansionists would try to prolong the war. Finding the treaty itself acceptable, Polk submitted it to the Senate without changes. He knew that ratification would face strong opposition from those who wanted to take all of Mexico. A force must be poured into the country sufficiently powerful to overall resistance. It is a glorious prospect, this annexation of all Mexico, New York Herald. But there were others in the Senate who feared the consequences of granting citizenship to Mexicans. Among them was John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. We have never dreamt of incorporating into our union any but the Caucasian race, the free white race. The greatest misfortunes of Spanish America are to be traced to the fatal error of placing these colored races on an equality with the white race. In the end, the moderates prevailed, and the U.S. Senate approved the treaty. The United States' dream of manifest destiny was now a reality. From the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, the nation had become a transcontinental power. Now it was up to Mexico to ratify the signed treaty. President Peña y Peña confronted extremist factions of his own in the Mexican Congress. Some delegates argued for continuing the war. 
Too many had sacrificed too much to accept defeat. When the war between Mexico and the United States was over, it left a profound frustration among the Mexican people. Because common people, everyday citizens, had seen their neighbors, their brothers, and ordinary soldiers die in a war that, for all the bloodshed, had resulted in the loss of half of Mexico's territory. At the beginning of the war, Manuel de la Peña y Peña had called for peace. Now he would preside over the dismemberment of his nation. It was, he said, his journey to the grave. Even so, he urged the Mexican people to accept the treaty. The people have an incontestable right not to have to suffer more. It would be a great inhumanity to put them through all the horrors of a renewed and bloody battle, especially after the many years of civil war. The truth is that a fertile and beautiful part of our territory is being ceded. I have no wish to obscure the truth, much less to deny the pain I feel at the separation from the Mexicans of California and New Mexico. The territories have not been given up for the sum of $15 million, but to recover our ports and invaded cities, to bring order to a people who have not ceased to suffer for 37 years. Let us do the right thing. Let us strip off the veil that has prevented us from seeing the reality of things. Let us make a mighty effort so that our children will not curse our memory. On May 30th, 1848, the Mexican Congress approved the treaty. The war was officially over. It was the end of a dream. The end, finally, of the greatness of New Spain, which, although it had faded, traces still remained. Now, suddenly, it was obvious that all that was history. I think the biggest thing that Americans have to realize is that uh, the Mexicans have not forgotten this. And so if we think that we are being uh, friendly, hospitable, generous in dealing with the Mexicans these days and find that they have some reserve because they're very conscious of history, I think an understanding of the Mexican War will let us understand better how they feel about it. I would like to leave as a final reflection the only benefit we had from this shocking experience. Of course, it was a painful mutilation of our territory, but in exchange, very expensively for sure, we found a spirit of Mexican identity. On the 4th of July, 1848, U.S. veterans of the war with Mexico marched proudly on parade in their nation's capital. Later that same day, the countersigned treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo arrived from Mexico City. James K. Polk had proved a man of his word. The goals he had set before the Congress and the nation early in his term had been fulfilled. Monday, August 14th, 1848. I am heartily rejoiced that the session of Congress is over. My long confinement and great labor has exhausted me, and I feel the absolute necessity of having a rest. Polk had hoped that his success would benefit his beloved Democratic Party, but his reward proved bitter. On Inauguration Day in 1849, he watched as his political rival, Zachary Taylor, the victor of Monterey and Buena Vista, was sworn in as the 12th president of the United States. Exhausted, Polk returned to his home in Tennessee. Three months later, he was dead. 
Although defeated in battle and forced into exile, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana would be called to the presidency of his country yet again in 1853. Two years later, he was back in exile, not to return to Mexico for nearly 20 years. I have drunk the cup of bitterness drop by drop. Nevertheless, I shall congratulate with the greatest pleasure the fortunate countryman who brings peace to our native land. Santa Ana lived out his remaining years in obscurity, without the wealth and fame he had so eagerly sought in his youth. In the end, all that remained was the loyalty of his wife, Doña Dolores Tosta de Santa Ana. Paga la gente del pueblo para que se acerque al balcón de la casa. She pays the people of the town to gather around the balcony of his house and shout, Viva Santa Ana! And Santa Ana would step out onto the balcony to thank the adoring public. If he didn't feel he was once again president, he could feel that it was once again possible. That was his fundamental reason for living. In the fall of 1848, Guillermo Prieto and the other writers of Apuntes, Notes for the History of the War between the United States and Mexico, published their work. There remained in our hearts a feeling of sadness for the evils the war had produced, and in our minds a fruitful lesson of how difficult it is to uphold the defense and salvation of a people when disorder Acrimony and anarchy prevail. Guillermo Prieto. Para México, perdimos el territorio. For Mexico, we lost the territory. Pero la experiencia de ser invadidos. But the experience of being invaded. Los elementos gave us Mexicans the necessary elements. Para pensar y recomponer. To rethink, to recreate our country, país, and consolidate our nation. Nuestra nación. In the years following the war with the United States, Mexico would continue to struggle with political division, civil war, and foreign intervention. But in 1867, in the aftermath of the War of the Reform, President Benito Juarez was able to unite Mexico and defeat a French invasion of the country. Unlike the divided republic that had confronted the United States, Mexico had become a stronger nation. Even so, the North American invasion would never be forgotten. It is difficult to overcome a defeat so traumatic, so painful. But in time, we will have to assimilate that. Surely, it's been a long time, and we have more important things to do in order to build a viable, modern, progressive, free, and just nation. In the United States, many Americans had become convinced that theirs was a republic for the ages, a model for the rest of the world to follow. The professional army General Winfield Scott had championed throughout his career would help transform the United States into an international power. There was a popular feeling the the United States has, has this destiny to become a, a world leader in industrial development, in commercial activity, uh, and even in reference to progress in the arts and sciences and intellectual uh, advance and intellectual achievement. This is all part of this idea of, of boundlessness, of, of no limits. This is this romantic notion that, that th through an act of will, individuals, Americans, can achieve this greatness for themselves and for their nation. But the United States' sudden expansion inflamed an issue that had haunted the nation since birth. Would these lands be slave or free? It was a question that would drive the Republic into civil war. When Generals Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant finally shook hands at Appomattox in 1865, they sought to ease the moment with talk of their experience in Mexico 18 years earlier. Near the end of his life, a disillusioned Ulysses Grant would write of the war with Mexico. 
I regard the war as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation. There were others who shared Grant's opinion that the United States had been at fault. And if not at fault, that it did not fully live up to its, uh, its ideology as expressed in the noblest of the um, American writings on democracy and freedom. This was a, an aggressive war in which we attacked a neighbor and however much we may have won from the war, we do not like to look at the way in which we won it. The lands taken from Mexico would become an important source of wealth for a growing United States. The discovery of gold in California spurred a great westward migration of entrepreneurs and settlers seeking new opportunities. For Native Americans, it was the latest invasion of their homeland and the beginning of another struggle for survival that would continue for generations. In the far distant past, the world seemed large enough for both the red man and the white man. He once came to trade. He comes now to fight. He covers his face with clouds of jealousy and anger and tells us to be gone. Saint Agya, sitting bear. After the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, more than 75,000 Mexicans chose to remain on land which had now become part of the United States. Most would become U.S. citizens, but many would lose the land on which their families had lived for generations. The United States does not claim them as full citizens. As a matter of fact, immediately almost sets up multiple, multiple barriers and multiple obstacles so that they are not considered full citizens, neither they nor the indigenous peoples that were already here either. And Mexico has lost sight of them, has lost them. So what of them? Who, not only who are these people, but they don't have, now, now they don't have a homeland and they don't have a nation. In California, even the wealthy Mariano Vallejo was unable to retain his place in the new order. In what many believed was a violation of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Vallejo was required to prove the validity of his land grants from Mexico. The legal battle forced him to sell much of his property to pay lawyers. In the end, he lost the rest to Yankee mortgage holders. The wheel of fortune is very fickle, Vallejo would write. It hit me among the first. At the time of his death in 1890, all that remained of his once vast estate was 228 acres, two horses, and a cow. The violence is um, not just military, but it is a violence um, of, of the soul. It is a violence of the spirit by those who commit that violence as well as by those who are on the receiving end. And from my perspective, we still live that violence. That violence has not healed. Uh, we live with the consequences of that violence. And for me, for us to go beyond that is to come to terms with it, is to acknowledge it. In 1947, Harry Truman became the first U.S. president to ever visit Mexico City. Unexpectedly, Mr. Truman makes an out-of-the-way stop at the Chapultepec Monument. Here he pays a simple tribute to the memory of Mexican youths who died 100 years ago defending their nation's capital against an American army. All Mexico was tremendously moved by this act. Truman brought to Mexico a promise. To observe the doctrine of non-intervention. What it means is that a strong nation does not have the right to impose its will by reason of its strength upon a weaker nation. The sooner we Mexicans confront how we have been in the presence of the United States, the better we'll be able to relate to the North Americans. Enough of myths that we are the victims of imperialism. Yes, certainly we were, and we were many other things as well. Our conditions in Mexico helped the United States and enabled it to do what it did, and to some degree, what it is doing even today. 
Entonces, a mí me parece que el, el caso de la guerra... So, for me, it seems that the war is a very important example of what Mexicans should recognize about how we were, what enormous problems we faced in such a critical time as the war, because it is absolutely necessary that we demystify our relations with the United States at a time when we are resolving new boundaries in terms of geopolitics, culture, and economics. And I think that that, that, that war, studying that war, it will help for a better future for those two countries that cannot change geography. They have to live together.